You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brantford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Let's call the meeting to order. Um, we will call this meeting of the Brantford Recording in progress. Order. It is, I have 704. It is Thursday, March 17th, 2022. I'll introduce members of the commission and staff here this evening. Uh, first, we have commission member Joe Chadwick. Joe, are you here? Joe Chadwick is present. Next, we have Joe Viuso, commission member Joe Viuso. Joe? I'll have to uh, ask him to unmute, I think. Um, where'd he go? You are unmuted. Okay, I'm unmuted now. I'm here, Joe Vayuso. Okay, thanks, okay, Joe. Thanks, 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 Joe. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Marcy uh, Pelosi. Marcy, are you here? Marcy Pelosi's here. And Massimo, Massimo Ligori. Massimo, are you here? Massimo Ligori is here. And Sharon Hutner. Sharon, are you here? Sharon Hutner is here. Those are our commission members. I am Chuck Anders, Chair. Our staff uh, this evening is our town planner, Harry Smith. Harry? Present. And our assistant planner, Evan Brining. Evan? Here. And our clerk recording secretary, uh, Catching this somewhere is Michelle Martin. Martin. Also, our so town attorney, right. Bill Inaskovich, is joining us. Bill? Bill is waving his acknowledgement. Uh, with that, uh, do we have a legal notice to read, or, or, or do we have any new public hearings for starting this? Uh, we have no legal notice. All the public hearings were continued from a prior meeting. Okay. So, unfortunately, Marcy, uh, well, you get off light tonight, Marcy, so you don't have to read the legal notice. Um, we, uh, we will follow our normal format for public hearings. That is that the applicant will go first. The applicant will make its presentation through its uh, attorney or staff member or, or experts or others. After the applicant's done with its presentation, we turn it over to the commission staff. We typically have uh, a staff report that uh, staff will summarize for it. We open up for questions and comments from commission members. After we complete that, we will open it up to the public. We ask that you uh, would state your name and address for the record, uh, make your comments. Um, after the public portion, we allow the applicant to respond to the public uh, with any comments that they like. And then uh, we may or may not close the public hearing, certainly for uh, it's not unusual to keep public hearings open for more than one evening. As this evening, we're, we're on the, uh, continuation of public hearings. So with that, I'm gonna ask Evan or Harry to review the process for the public to participate in the public hearing process. Uh, sure, if your computer has a microphone for two-way communication and during the public hearing you would wish to speak, please use the raise your hand function. Down at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. Once you press that, the bottom most option is raise your hand. Uh, if you would like to type in your comments, you can also do so. You can also indicate that you'd like to speak in the chat as well. Um, and if you are dialing in, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand and I will unmute. And uh, also please uh, state your name uh, before you comment or ask a question. Chuck Anders, Chair. Thank you, Evan. With that, we'll return to our public hearing agenda. We'll turn to the first two items, which are the commonly known as the Amazon application. The applicant is FSI Acquisitions LLC, Chair of John Nuff Applicant, Hamilton Brampton LLC owner of 80, 81 111 Commercial Parkway, 
49 Commercial Parkway LLC is the owner of 49 Commercial Parkway and 81111 uh, Commercial Parkway and 49 Commercial Parkway. We have the special exception for grading and the special exception for warehouse distribution and e-commerce fulfillment center. We've had uh, a couple of evenings of public hearing and um, uh, this is our third uh, evening where we're considering this. Is the applicant ready to proceed? We are, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, John Nuff. I, uh, I'm an attorney representing FSI, the applicant, and the contract purchase of the property. And my uh, address is 147 Broad Street in Milford, Connecticut. Um, as I mentioned, you know we have a fairly concise um, presentation for this evening. Um, you know, I think we've accomplished a lot uh, throughout the course of the, the months that we've been uh, working with the town and in particular with the, uh, the past couple of meetings with this commission. And I think we're, I mean, frankly, down to, I don't want to say the nitty gritty, but some, a, a lot of the details, um, you know, have been resolved and there's a few stragglers that we hope to get out of the way this evening. Um, so we're, we're going to re respond to all the remaining issues, regardless of their source, whether it comes from the commission, from staff or public. And I think we can do so in a um, very efficient manner. Um, you know, so uh, we appreciate our continued uh, cooperation with Harry and Evan. We've uh, had another conversation with them. We had or actually several conversations. We received a new uh, memo from Evan dated March 11th. We responded on March 15th. We have submitted a response memo in regard to all the uh, uh, outstanding uh, comments in, in Evan's memo. We're gonna go through those uh, in some detail where appropriate. We know that there are a few um, traffic issues you wanted us to discuss and we'll do that. And then I think there's just um, a few, as I said, straggler issues with regard to uh, either the site or the building. So let me start out. So generally how we'll break this down is, you know, site design and um, engineering landscaping issues primarily uh, responding to comments in Evan's memo, and then we'll turn our attention to traffic, and then we'll can, um, you know, hear any uh, comments or questions from the commission. So very briefly, we've, we've made, um, I think all the changes that we can make with regard to uh, the site plan, particularly with regard to landscaping, and Dennis will show those two in a minute. Um, you'll see that we do need a waiver under section 6.3.L with regard to uh, a, a very narrow landscape strip along the, um, I guess the, the the ramp that leads out of the canopy area out to Commercial Parkway. Um, landscaping there just doesn't work uh, as Dennis will explain. Um, but I think you'll hear from him that uh, a waiver in that area is appropriate given the fact that we are adding nearly 2000 plants to the entire site. So um, we think that's entirely appropriate, but we'll, we'll um, Dennis will, will go through in, in some detail in that area, but I just want to uh, alert the commission that, that we will be asking for a, a waiver under 63L for a very small portion of the site. Um, there was a question from staff with regard to us extending the sidewalk beyond our own property, uh, going up to where the, the Vox Church on property that's owned by, I think, Cherry Hill or Robert Sachs. We're happy to work with the town. We're happy to work with anybody. But for obvious liability issues, we, we can't construct it. We won't construct it. If you want some financial contribution, if you want us to help in some way, we're happy to do that. Um, but it's just been Amazon's experience, as, as you can imagine, any national uh, entity that should they construct something, you know, even if someone should slip and fall, it's not even property that they own, that somehow they're going to wind up as a defendant in a, in a lawsuit. So as I said, we're happy to contribute. We're happy to help. Um, but we're not going to, we won't construct a sidewalk on property that we don't control or, or we don't own. Um, number three, um, the uh, infamous canopy lighting issue, which I think has now reached dead horse status. But uh, I can report that as an accommodation to the requests of the town, um, we can lower the lighting level to eight foot candles under the canopy but with a motion sensor that would increase the lighting levels to 10.9. We think this is an entirely rational and reasonable approach to um, um, staff's request. As we indicated at some length last time, you know, this sort of use falls, falls in the gap between the various uses that are indicated in your uh, appendix B in terms of lighting. 
We still think that it is more a canopy for an auto use than it is a uh, pedestrian building exterior. But nonetheless, we think that this is a, a viable, reasonable accommodation uh, between the town and the commission and, and, and our clients. Particularly since if you, if you recall, when that canopy area will be most active is going to be you know, you know, relatively early in the morning, seven o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, when the lands get, when the vans get loaded, and then a little bit more in the afternoon when the flex drivers appear. So in the middle of the night, um, these lights will continue to be at eight foot candles, except under the very unusual condition that someone should activate that motion sensor and they would go up to 10.9. So if the, if the concern is that um, the lighting level exceeds um, you know, eight foot candles. I'm certainly there's a roof on that on that lighting, so there's no dark sky issues. But in terms of if there's any uh, concern about glare or impacts on neighboring property owners, and as we know, that canopy is directly adjacent to commercial parkway, so that we have no real um, neighboring property owners. I think we've we've uh, sufficiently accommodated that to make sure that in nearly all cases during the nighttime hours, we're going to be at eight foot candles. Um, and then the last sort of um, thing that I'm going to handle with regard to the, the overall design is that there was a question from the public as to whether or not our roof will, will be white, <laughs> indeed it will be, and that will help mitigate a heat island uh, uh, effect uh, from the building. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dennis Godier to walk you through some of the changes with regard to landscaping, and then we'll get to traffic. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can um, see my screen. Yeah, you're all right, set. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I get into the landscaping, I just want a couple of housekeeping on some signage um, items. It was noted in mean, one of the, uh, the comments uh, associated with monument signs um, that you know, there is a zoning permit that's required. Just want to acknowledge that we understand that. And um, at the time that's appropriate, we'd be filing for that zoning permit um, with the um, uh, department. Um, and then um, there was an, uh, an oversight on our part that we did not remove the reference to a tenant logo um, on the um, interior signage um, that has been um, updated um, in the recent resubmission uh, and, and has been addressed. Um, so I have foregone the um, really fancy color renderings, um, uh, but some sharing some of the uh, more technical drawings that we submitted. Um, so this is the landscape plan, and you can see obviously the building, commercial parkway up along the top side. One of the comments was to enhance the landscaping in the front yard, um, which we have done by adding some um, areas of plant beds to uh, um, break up the green space of the lawn here, and then furthermore over in this location, and then to line the uh, entrance drive um, as people um, enter, but still allowing um, location for uh, snow storage um, um, and then addressing, you know, where there's certain directional signage and site lighting as well. Um, as Attorney Nuff had mentioned, uh, the location which we are asking the waiver for on uh, the landscaping below the wall, and I'm just going to highlight it over here, is along the drive where the vans exit. Uh, this is needed for snow storage, um, and uh, we just, it, no um, plant material will end up surviving in that location. Uh, another comment was to enhance the, um, and add landscaping below the wall along this area. We had not, we did not include that prior because we felt that the existing landscaping and um, um, vegetation um, near the connector um, was going to screen the wall anyways, but we did add all along um, and, and through uh, this area, as I'm highlighting. We've increased the amount of, and also really enhanced it throughout this area as well. Um, in addition, um, there was, and I'm gonna switch to a different plan. Um, concern about headlights uh, from the van parking area. So I'm now in, I apologize, I'm now in the north um, west corner. So the connector is right here. Um, and this is the van parking. The building is, is off of this plan. Um, 
And so what we have done here, um, and I, we created a couple cross sections to uh, convey what's happening in that majority of this area has a retaining wall where the vans are actually sitting below um, um, the, uh, the existing grade. So this is at a cut situation. So this, that's what this cross section shows. So a van would be here. In no location is the wall higher than seven and a half feet where the regulation allows um, up to eight feet for a retaining wall. Um, there is um, existing um, vegetation between um, from our property line to the connector that will remain. Uh, and as I think we had noted during the last um, hearing, we are also adding uh, landscaping um, along the top of that wall. So you can see um, you know, the majority of the area is around seven and a half feet. It goes down to maybe three and a half feet in, in the southern portion, but that will screen any of the headlights um, um, and activities um, along that area that might interfere with traffic um, along the connector or properties beyond. Uh, the one area that that situation does not occur is through here. Uh, this is actually in a fill condition where the retaining wall um, is you know, the vans would be above and we did add, I'll zoom in, we did add a six foot high fence. Um, our response to the comment was for a chain link fence with slats. Um, additional comments came back and um, we are amenable and our client is amenable, the applicant is amenable to um, a, a, a vinyl fence. Um, so to ensure that it's completely um, opaque. And again, that is in this location here. And we've actually continued the fence around the corner uh, to help ensure um, the protection. And I think with that, John, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Dennis. So well, I, actually, John, I do have that one, one more item I want to mention on the landscaping. Um, and I, I think um, Attorney Nuff had mentioned it, alluded to it. Uh, yeah, we've got 1,848 um, plants that we are proposing um, to install on, on, on this property. Of that Break down 216 are small to large trees. There's 302 shrubs of varying um, varieties. Uh, from an ornamental and ground cover standpoint, is 480 plants. Um, and on the base of the retaining walls or on top of the retaining walls, there's 750 um, shrubs that are being um, planted. Um, and then within the rain garden um, itself, um, there's another 100. Um, plants. So that's almost 2,000 uh, plants in, in total, which is a substantial amount for a development of this of this type. Thanks, Dennis. And, and really, it's for that reason that we're asking for the waiver under 6.3.L number two, which says the commission may modify certain specific requirements when warranted by excellence in landscape design. I, I don't think that, you know, as you, if you look at the, of the totality of the landscape plan, uh, it's sort of overwhelming the density of, of, of plant material that, you know, Dennis and his team and Wayne Violet have been able to uh, cram onto the site. Uh, I think we have been fully responsive in every possible way to the staff comments and their very careful review of our landscape design um, under your regulations. And so uh, we respectfully request that waiver. So that's the, um, the site and landscape issues. Um, I, I don't know that we... It, um, it warrants any further discussion on the lighting underneath the canopy. And so with that, I just want to turn quickly over to the two outstanding traffic issues. And those traffic issues were, uh, number one, uh, Mr. Chairman, you had asked last time uh, whether we could provide a memo detailing what the authority of the town is uh, post-approval, post-construction um, of the commission or of the town. And, and we have provided a memo to um, to your staff and I, which I assume has been distributed to all of you, um, you know, breaking that down. And, and really what it comes down to is that, um, you know, we, re we are required to get a certificate from OSTA, as we've been saying um, multiple times from the, the several hearings where, where we've been together. As you may know, every OSTA certificate that they, that OSTA issues has a provision that says, we get to review your traffic on an ongoing basis and should something change, we get to require you to make changes to uh, respond to those uh, changes in traffic. Um, so you will find that on, on, on every certificate that OSTA issues, I've seen it on every traffic investigation report, that's the actual report that's issued along the certificate uh, in my three decades of, of doing this. So 
um, that is OSTA's oversight. With regard to the town, um, your police chief is the local traffic authority. And your local traffic authority has the opportunity to petition, request, contact OSTA and say, um, we have noticed, and by the way, this happens you know, everywhere, in any town, under any certificate, there is a um, appreciable change in the character of traffic associated with development X. And we would uh, respectfully request that you re-review re the, the traffic associated with uh, that project. And OSTA can go and do that on, you know, either on its own volition or at the request of your local traffic authority. In addition, your local traffic authority has the opportunity to request um, from OSTA the ability to curtail or limit or preclude uh, uh, truck traffic on certain town roads. So um, again, you would need OSTA approval for that signage, but um, your local traffic authority uh, has, uh, has that ability to um, request uh, approval from OSTA for uh, limiting truck traffic. So um, that's not to say that the commission co can come back and re-review traffic, but it, it is, it's not as if the town is without any authority or any ability to um, ask for uh, changes after the fact once the, uh, any site becomes operational that is subject to a certificate from OSTA. So I think that resolves that issue. And then I think the last traffic issue, Mr. Chairman, there was there was some discussion, I think, by both the commission and maybe some members of the public, because we had uh, spent a lot of time detailing the fact that we would not have um, negative impacts on the levels of service during peak hours, peak hours being obviously the morning commute, the evening commute, and, and Saturday afternoon. And someone asked the question, well, what happens uh, if you are sending your traffic out on non-peak hours, well, what's happening to the traffic um, at those times? Um, and so that's why uh, Rob Baltramitis, with his uh, his uh, honorary Irishman today, I assume, with his, given his green tie, um, he can uh, describe to you uh, how even if the traffic is going out at, at the non-peak hours, it doesn't have a negative impact on the roadway network at those times either. So Rob, Rob take it away. Uh, thank you, Attorney Nuff. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, for your record, I'm Rob Ultramitis, licensed professional engineer. So um, the traffic analyses provided to you to date have considered the peak hours for the roadway network. As Attorney Nuff mentioned, that's your typical weekday morning peak period, sometime between 7 and 9 a.m., uh, a weekday p.m. peak period, usually be between 4 and 6 p.m., and then a Saturday <laughs> midday, um, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this is very standard um, practice in the traffic engineering profession. Um, but we recognize and we've testified that that our site will have um, its own peak traffic that differs from that of the roadway network. Um, and that's really, frankly, that's why our project works so well. We have non-coincidental traffic peaks. When the roadway is peaking, okay. the site is not. When the site is peaking, the roadway is not. But the question came up, what are the levels of service results during um, such a, a, an off-peak scenario? And it's a, it's a fair enough question. So uh, we did a cursory analysis of a, of a fourth scenario, if you will, that considers the most conservative off-peak scenario. Um, so from a traffic perspective, you've had an awful lot of data submitted to you, but one of those things was a detailed site traffic generation spreadsheet, um, which detailed the projected comings and goings of various vehicles yeah. from this site. Uh, and that was prepared by Amazon and it's based on their experience, their experience um, with their program of developing these last mile facilities across the country. And also a number of um, site specific factors such as the number of on-site associates at this facility, the number of vans uh, needed to service the, um, the, the service area, which we've discussed with you. Um, the facility will operate 24 hours around the clock with some peaks in its traffic generation. And the heaviest of which is between 10 and 11 a.m. And again, that is outside of that roadway peak of eight to nine a.m. So we took that conservative site traffic estimate and we applied it to the applicable background traffic that's already on the roadway network from uh, 10 to 11 a.m. And what we found is even with this new site traffic, we still have very good levels of service. In fact, we maintain an overall level of service B 
at our study intersections of Commercial Parkway at Route 1, the Brantford Connector at Route 1, uh, West Main Street, Route 146 at Route 1, and Short Beach, Short Beach Road, Route 142 at Route 1. And even the individual movement level services are, are good and very good. So I, I suppose we could have included this fourth off-peak scenario in the traffic impact study. Um, but again, we, we followed ITE guidelines. We followed DOT and traffic engineering industry practice. And that's why we included the three scenarios that considered the peak of the roadway network. So um, in summary, when our site is having its peak, there's less traffic on the roadway network. Um, and then as I stated before, this project does not have a significant or tangible impact on the roadway network. And um, uh, that's that's my my summary. And you know, I'll obviously here for any questions. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all we have. I think we've, uh, as I said, you know, tidied up all the loose ends. Uh, obviously, we're all here to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, so I, I think we can go on to the next step. Uh, Chuck Andrews here. Thank you, Mr. Duff. We're going to uh, turn it over to uh, staff and commission members. Just a couple of questions. I know one member of the public, I think it was Kate Columbus, had some specific, was, was looking at the numbers and, and numbers didn't seem to add up. It seemed like an answerable question, but I, I don't know if you remember that or if you guys had the opportunity to look at that, that question. I, it's just something that was raised. Mr. Nuff, do, do you remember what I'm talking about? Or? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I do remember that, uh, I think she used the spreadsheet that we had supplied to staff in regard to one of the very early um, uh, comment letters by uh, Steve Ullman, uh, in, in, where we gave the you know the 24 hour cycle of of our traffic, um, and 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 I think that's what Rob Baltrius was trying to respond to is you know trying to give you the, a sense of what the traffic is during non peak hours as well. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I I thought uh, well well she can have uh, further comments, and, and as I understand, Mister. Uh, Baltramitis, you, 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 you follow the conventions by, by doing it, by looking at the peak hours, but when you looked at your own peak the, and, and did the analysis for that, it wasn't any lower than level of service B, was that correct? That, that's, correct. that's correct. For, for the study intersections right in the site vicinity, so that included Route 1 at Route 142, Route 1 at the Brantford Connector, Route one at Commercial Parkway and Route one at Route 146. That's correct. Okay. And is it fair to say then that, you know, I know you looked at the 10 to 11, but that would, it would probably never be lower than, because, uh, you know, for, for the other off peak hours, it would all, you wouldn't expect this to cause any level of service no. diminution. I, I for those other hours either. Is that correct? Correct. I, it is correct. I, I would not at all. And, and, and here's why. Um, the, that off-peak study uh, period of 10 to 11, um, there was a total um, uh, 234 vehicles associated at our, at our site coming in or out. That was the worst case in the 24-hour um, cycle of the facility, if you will. The next closest is 200 vehicles in an hour. That occurs after 8 p.m. at night where the Route 1 volumes drop off significantly. They're probably 70% 70, 70 less than the p.m. peak. So yeah, you know, I would not expect uh, uh, an impact. Thank you, Andrew, sir. Thank you, Mr. Baltimaitis. I see you. that we have with us our own expert, Mr. Ullman. Uh, <laughs> just since we're just talking about this traffic stuff, Mr. Ullman, I, you've had a, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to what Mr. Baltimaitis uh, commented on and do, do you have any, uh, do you agree or disagree or thoughts one way or the other? Well, I, I agree with, with the original premise that you studied the peak hours and your uh, higher traffic or your other traffic during the, throughout the day uh, will not be worse than those levels of service is probably the best way to put it. Uh, just for information, I looked up the 24-hour DOT count site, which is just to the east of Commercial Parkway, and looked at the 2016 volumes, which were pre-COVID. And the 10 to 11 hour is approximately 45% less than the PMP period. Uh, as, as Rob said, the eight to nine is starting to get even lower than that, probably 70, 75% is a good estimate for it. So it makes sense that 
even though our site's generating more traffic at, a, at 10 to 11, the roadway volumes are considerably less than you have during the peak periods. So therefore, what we, the way I usually phrase it is that we study the peak periods and therefore we can safely say that it will operate at that level of service or better throughout the day. And his, indeed his analysis report on 10 to 11 I found this on uh, uh, validates that. It makes sense. Uh, okay. So I, I, it's not surprising what he found. To be okay. honest, it does. Uh, okay. I understand the public's look at it, and they look at what the different numbers are and how much higher they are during the non-peaks. It can be, you know, can be concerning, but that's just the way it works on the in the field. That we don't realize just how much less traffic there is during those off-peak periods. Okay. Uh, Chuck Anderson, here. Thank you, Mr. Olman. Uh, at this one, may, maybe we'll turn over to staff, uh, Evan and Mary, do you want to review uh, any updates from your staff reports? Uh, sure, like the applicant stated, uh, they had submitted some revisions and memos to us uh, yesterday on the 16th in response to my staff report from last week. Uh, I'll try my best to work those revisions into um, my discussion tonight. However, I would like an opportunity to, re to revise my staff report based on that last submission. Uh, I will start with the front yard landscaping requirements that Mr. Godier reviewed for us. Uh, it appears that with this additional plantings, they meet uh, this front yard landscaping requirement. Uh, they also satisfy the side and rear yard uh, property uh, line planting requirements. Uh, looks like they added a number of trees as well as arborvitaes, uh, as well as those plantings at the bottom of the retaining wall. Um, they meet the off street parking requirements as well, and they have removed the tenant logo signs uh, from sheet DN2, um, as well as their acknowledgement that the requirement for zoning permits for those signs uh, or for the other signs that they have proposed. Uh, concerning the outdoor lighting requirements of section 6.7, uh, they have confirmed that uh, they're the proposed lighting will not reach the 3000 Kelvin mark um, and they have not reduced the illuminance level in that canopy area. However, like Mr. Nuff stated, they are proposing to install motion sensors uh, to temporarily reduce that level uh, to be in compliance. I believe that's a determination that the commission will have to make to whether or not this satisfy, satisfies this requirement. Um, the applicant has also stated that uh, operations on the site will be conducted 24 hours a day. Uh, therefore, there will be no off business hours and therefore there will be no uh, reduction um, of non-essential lighting outside of that canopy area on the site. Um, they have removed some trees from the sight lines of the exits. Um, and concerning the retaining walls, um, they have provided those cross sections that Mr. Godier showed us earlier, uh, showing uh, that the areas that would not have guardrails or fencing at the top of the walls would not pose a threat to the safety of pedestrians or automobiles. Um, and they have also added uh, some plantings onto the terraces of the retaining walls and they have added the plantings at the bottom of the retaining walls as I just discussed um, and they will be requesting waiver of that final requirement for the retaining wall between the parking lot and the exit ramp for the vans. Um, Concerning the sidewalks that they're proposing, the applicant proposes sidewalks along the entirety of the road frontage, uh, but does not propose continuing the sidewalk to connect with the property at 131 Commercial Parkway. That is the property that Box Church is on. Um, there is around an 80 foot separation between the end of that property si sidewalks and the proposed sidewalks. Um, 
and ADA accessible curb ramps have been added uh, along with a crosswalk to the Walmart property. Um, staff had requested or staff had recommended that the commission re request that those sidewalks be installed uh, on the northernmost portion of the property, uh, which may actually be on the Vox Church property. Uh, however, the applicant stated earlier that that would not be something they are capable of doing. Um, and the applicant has provided a statement describing how they meet the criteria of section six of section 9.8 F. Uh, and at this time, staff has no additional recommendations uh, concerning the closing of the public hearing. Chuck Anders chair. Thank you, Evan. Carrie, did you have anything you'd like to add at this point? Uh, I'd just like to bring up one thing, Harry Smith Town Planner. Uh, the engineering department has identified, I believe it's uh, a very small amount of work that would need to take place um, to facilitate this project, I believe on the property owned by um, the Sachs of Cherry Hill Construction, um, upon which the Vox Church is located. Um, it looks like an installation of a, a sanitary sewer manhole and possibly a little bit of work on the sewer line. Um, so I just would um, encourage and appreciate the comment about the sidewalk, but this would, is my understanding, require uh, some communication and an agreement with the adjoining property owner for that work, which would facilitate this project. And perhaps as part of that discussion, um, there could be a discussion about how to accomplish the connection of the sidewalk with the sidewalk coming from the Box Church property. Uh, check out, Anders Chair. Mr. Nuff, did you hear that? And do you, I don't know if you have any immediate response. No, I, I mean, we're more than happy to cooperate in, in any possible way, including financially. And we understand that we do have to work with uh, Robert Sachs and Cherry Hill with regard to the uh, utility easement. But um, we just want to completely disassociate ourselves with any construction of the sidewalk for liability issues. So, um, yeah. It's not a financial issue of any kind. It is just, you know, this sidewalk and this site will be operational for, you know, 20, 30 years in the future. And we just want to, you know, make sure that there's a very clear line of demarcation of what we're responsible for and what we're not. Yeah. Harry Smith, top player, that's certainly understandable. I just wanted to point out the opportunity is going to you know, present itself with discussion with the Navy property or anyway. So, but thank you. And, 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 and we, we don't need to get into how often that sidewalk will be used. We understand the, the intent, and, um, but you know, uh, I, I think we're doing the best we can in, in a very reasonable way. No, I appreciate the responsiveness. Uh, Chuck Anders Chair, and I'll, I'll just ask a question on, on again, the, the, uh, the traffic issue and the authority of the commission to address that. I, as I, where this originated is, I believe the, the the chairman or the head of the Shore Beach Civic Association at the last meeting uh, raised some concerns. I, I think it's sort of based on a series of hypotheticals. Hypothetically, what if Tweed becomes the destination point for freight and that the Amazon big freight trucks start going to Tweed to pick that up? And hypothetically, what if they decide not to go on Hemingway and 95 and X53, but they go, which is a physically shorter route, you know, over I think Dodge Avenue and Hemming and uh, another road to to get on uh, and go on Short Beach Row, and you, so you have big traffic, uh, big tractor trailer trucks going right through Short Beach, right up 142. And so the concern was, hey, why don't you, as the commission, just say you can't do that and just ban them? You know, even if it hasn't happened, but say you can't do that. You know, that was sort of, do you even have authority to do that? And my understanding of your answer is that we don't, <laughs> um, that, that at least th th it is possible to place restrictions for, for government authorities, place restrictions on truck traffic. And, and I, I, under the scenario I mentioned, I think there'd be a lot of, I, I think the road, I'm familiar with the route because I ride my bike to New Haven actually sometimes, and I go right by the airport and right by Short Beach. And there's a lot of residential areas if you went that path that some tractor trailers would be <laughs> a lot of people from East Haven would be uh, not happy with that either. But, but any of that, I, my, my understanding is that the answer is we don't have authority to do that, but we can request our local traffic authority, which is a police chief to request OSTA, 
to review this. And since it's a state road, they would have authority to say no through you know large trucks or something on that. Is that correct, Mr. Knopf? That is that that is one hundred percent correct. And um, and if if you if you don't believe me, your your very capable town attorney is here. You can confirm that with him as well. Uh, uh, th thank you, Mr. Knopf. Mr. Anaskovich, is uh, did did you have any comments on that issue that you might be helpful for us? Uh, Bill Anaskovich, Brenner Saltzman, and Um Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did have the opportunity to review. Um, the memo attorney Nuff's office prepared. Um, I did also have an opportunity to speak to the town planner about it earlier this evening, and I submitted to the town planner uh, with a copy to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, my, my general comments on it, um, which I'll summarize now. Um, I absolutely agree with the statement that the uh, applicant's attorney has made that the town under its regulations, uh, that the commission under its regulations uh, has no authority to prohibit that uh, absent some very clear standards that don't apply in this particular case, um, and that absent uh, any actual uh, projected in traffic impact uh, or tractor trailer travel on Route 142, um, that any attempt to condition approval uh, upon the basis of those hypothetical concerns or even deny the application based on those hypothetical concerns wouldn't survive a, a reasonableness challenge in court. Um, however, having said that, uh, I think you both have accurately stated um, that as this is a major traffic generator, it will require a certificate from OSTA, um, that that review process of granting the certificate includes input, input from the local traffic authority at the very beginning of the process, and that there would be a reservation pursuant to state law in any certificate granted um, that would provide ongoing regulatory authority um, on the part of OSTA uh, and that the police commissioners as the local traffic authority could at any time that those hypothetical concerns became real uh, request a, uh, a regulation that would prohibit the through traffic of tractor trailers. I also point out in my email that to the extent that these concerns were based on a COG uh, a report um, uh, that, 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 that that report itself was the subject of a, uh, an amendment in which the language uh, that uh, committed the town of East Haven and the city of New Haven to evaluating potential increases in cargo uh, freight traffic uh, from Tweed was removed and replaced with a provision uh, that basically commits the area to work with the Council of Governments on enhancing passenger travel out of Tweed. So it appears uh, that that motion was made actually by uh, our first selectman um, who serves on the transportation committee of the, co of, of, of the Southeast, the uh, South Central Region Council of Governments at the March 9th meeting. Uh, that goes for final approval to the full COG. Um, so I think it, um, it's worth the commission noting um, that 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 uh, the basis for those uh, conjectures is is somewhat uh, uh, misplaced at this point as well. So, regardless uh, that if the actual traffic pattern changed, um, the town through its local traffic authority would continue legally to have the ability to 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 do what was suggested should be done on Route 142 should there be some factual basis in, in reality um, for, that, for that concern. So I believe that the town um, has the legal authority uh, in the future to address any change. Chuck okay, Anders, Chair, thank you, Mr. Anastovich. At this point, let's open it up to questions, comments from commission members. Any member of the commission have questions and comments before we open it up to the public? Sharon? Thank you, uh, Sharon Hutner. I would um, like to make a comment about the landscaping. I do appreciate tremendously that the applicant is gonna be putting 2000 plants into this area that really is very barren now and that really will um, improve this, um, this area tremendously. Um, I wanted the applicant to know that Brantford 
is supports the use of native plants in all of its development and new development. And I looked through the landscaping um, plans and I couldn't see the names of any specific plantings that were being used. I did look through the landscaping notes and I saw that it said that the trees and shrubs have, have to be grown at a commercial nursery within 200 miles of the project site, unless otherwise approved by the owner or landscape architect. But there was still no specific specificity about it being native. There was also something that the um, that these um, trees and shrubs should be typical of their species, but again, nothing about native varieties. So I'm new at this, and so I'm wondering if I missed it. Yeah, yeah, you missed it. I did. Okay, where where would I find it? Uh, um, I'm not, I. I, I I, go ahead, John, I, I, Dennis Godier, um, for the record, I'm landscape architect as well as a project manager from VL Companies. Um, on sheet LL-0 is the complete list of all of the plant species, um, as well as the quantities and the specifications of the size of, of what they need to be as a minimum size. Um, if it's a tree, it's uh, measured generally by caliper, <clears throat> uh, depending on the type of tree. Um, if it's a shrub, it's uh, generally the, the, the spread or the height of the plant. Um, so that is all very detailed um, on that sheet LL-0. Um, and, and then each of the sheets of LL-1 and LL-2 are coded with um, um, the key that references back to each of those tables. Um, yep. Majority, we always strive to use um, uh, native plantings because they're indigenous to the area. They're, they're usually hardier. Um, um, if we are not utilizing, uh, and this is a standard practice, if we're not utilizing a indigenous or, or native uh, plant, it's usually one that is hardy in the, uh, in the area and proven not to be an invasive. Um, um, but um, you know, can be still a contributing um, plant to the landscape, either ornamentally or from uh, an environmental habitat standpoint. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I missed it. And um, I'm very happy that you're gonna be adding this kind of landscape to Brantford. So thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, could I ask a follow up question? Certainly. Uh, Harry Smith, Town Planner. Uh, Dennis, uh, could you characterize, uh, you know, roughly the percent of natives versus non-natives? Just if you have that information at your fingertips. Uh, Chuck Anderson, Mr. Goodyear, you're muted. Can I give you a rough number of around fifty percent? Okay. Thank you. It might actually be higher. Um, I, I'm just yeah. I'm quickly perusing the quantity yeah, yeah, of yeah, the 1800s. I, so. I understand. Yeah. Well, but given that comment, could we try to make the percentage higher? Did you say 50%, five zero? I, I'm, I'm, I'm working off the cuff here. So I, I, if there's other questions, um, I can go back and, and do some math over the next five minutes or so. Well, it would just be... Um, a request that you use as many native plants as you possibly can. It would be great if it was 100%. So that's my request. Thank you. We would be happy to accept a condition that we continue to work with Harry and Evan on maximizing the opportunity for native plants. Thank you. Chuck Anders, Chair. Thank, thank you, Sharon. Uh, other members of the commission have questions or comments before we open up to the public? I'm Osmo Ligori here. Um, I just have a question. Um, I was just wondering if um, Amazon had reached out to our state representatives to see um, if you could work with them at all, uh, or, or maybe ask them to get a um, northbound exit maybe uh, put in, or uh, maybe lobby for that. I know that the town, uh, the town officials in Brentford are 
lobbying for that. I know that um, the funding is available for that. And I think that if our state representatives get involved and with the help of the public and Amazon, uh, including our town uh, officials, um, you know, get our state representatives that were elected to uh, maybe go and, um, you know, go to Hartford and uh, maybe you guys can all collaborate together and see if we could get a uh, northbound exit put on, on 53. If, if I think if everybody, if Amazon and the town and, and the people um, lobby for this uh, at this moment um, where the funding is available, um, I was just wondering if you guys had did that. And, um, and I'm also wondering the, the issue of, um, are, are it, you know, coming from going, you know, using certain um, routes from Tweed. Um, it, can you not put restrictions on your drivers because they are not Amazon employees or third party? Um, um, do you hire third party uh, employees or are they Amazon employees? Because, you know, I mean, um, keeping it simple would be to say use a certain route. And I don't know if that's possible, but uh, if not, it's probably because there's a third party being used. That's my two questions. Okay, uh, happy to respond to both of those. Uh, taking the, the second one first. So obviously the vans will need to go make deliveries in areas where um, you know, people have ordered products. I, I, I think the, the chairman's question with regard to limiting truck traffic was, was with regard to tractor trailer traffic and not van traffic. And I think we've, we've answered that one, which is um, should there be a change in the future, which none of us anticipates, there's no present intent in using Tweed in any manner, shape or form uh, of tractor trailers going on 146, then the town has an, has an ample opportunity to petition OSTA to make the requested changes. Um, you know, you know, Amazon would be happy, my client would be happy to help support any efforts of the town and the state to reconfigure exit 53, but certainly, you know, we're, we're just um, a private property owner and a tenant uh, who will be utilizing the site that, you know, uh, Home Depot or a grocery store or anyone else could, could utilize. Um, we certainly won't stand in their way. We know that and we have testified that that the current design for our facility does not in any way preclude any improvements to um, exit 53 in the future. And we're happy to play a role, but it's not something that we can initiate or fund or you know create all on our own. No, I understand that. I just, it would be nice. I mean, Amazon is, uh, you know, pretty big and, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the representatives, uh, the state representatives sort of, um, you know, uh, it would be nice for you guys to just sort of at least send a letter and, uh, you know, help, help out out of courtesy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Massimo. And, and Mr. Nuff, I, 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 I'm sort of just uh, speculating a bit, but what you mentioned is that you're potentially liable for future offsite improvements you know, if traffic conditions worse or something that just turns out or maybe your hours change or something. It seems to me that if you ever got an exit 50 <laughs> at northbound so the trucks could get off at exit 53 versus 54, um, you know, that would be to your advantage. It would, it would minimize the likelihood that you'd have to pay for other offsite improvements if that ever went through. So I don't know, I, I could see a way that, that you're- 100%, I, 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 right, I, I would agree with that. I, I think a lot right. of people would be happy if there was a change, but certainly not within our ability to do on our own. Understood. Other uh, questions for uh, uh, Mr. Anaskovich? Uh, you're muted, Thanks. Bill. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just wanna, I wanna address the, the comment that um, uh, Massimo uh, ju just made. Um, I will tell you that um, as someone who served for uh, 14 years in the state Senate, 10 of which uh, I served on the transportation committee um, representing this town, I, was, I participated in more than a half dozen efforts by uh, landowners and others, uh, some of which included direct offers to the Department of Transportation to fund improvements that would uh, solve the exit 53 off-ramp problem um, only to be rebuffed every single time. 
um, there is an ongoing and, and continuous effort um, to get uh, the kind of support that the town would need. Um, and I think that uh, we, we can take Amazon as at their word as we have taken every other proposed developer at that site that they would cooperate. Um, it is not simply a matter of, of, of whether or not the, the funds are available. So I think it's important for commission members to, to, to know the history of that. Dr. Andrews, sir, thank you, Mr. Janskovich. Uh, other questions, comments from commission members before we open up to the public? Uh, yes, Marcy Pluzzi, just a simple question because I can't see on the plans. The sidewalk is on the same side of the street or opposite side of the street as Amazon? I'm having a hard time seeing it on the same side. Hey, hey. Same side. It's on the opposite side of the street, RC. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the oh. sidewalk on the uh, Vox Church property is on the opposite side. I'm just saying, but the continuously running along Commercial Parkway, that's has sidewalk or that does not have sidewalk? I'm not sure I understand. Um, let me try, Marcy. The, they're proposing a continuous sidewalk along their frontage on Commercial Parkway along the entirety of it at this point. And there also is a sidewalk on the opposite side along the frontage of Walmart, I believe, almost the continuous frontage, I believe. There'll be sidewalks on both sides of the road and the, the sidewalk that we're talking about for them to put additional money to is because Vox Church did not install sidewalks? No, they did. They installed the sidewalk um, to basically the end of their property line. This would close a gap to where a crosswalk that could come from the Vox Church sidewalk across the Vox Church driveway onto the cul-de-sac at the end of Commercial Parkway could connect up to the sidewalk along the Amazon uh, property. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to understand why if they're budding properties, it, it's not a clean break between, you know, taking it to the property line. Um, I, I think it was site logistics on the Vox Church property. I think bringing it on that side uh, there was no sidewalk at this point to connect to at that point when Vox Church went through the approval process. And I think there was some issues with bringing it down there if I recall correctly, so. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Anders here, thank you, Marcy. Any other questions, comments from commission members before we open it up? Hearing none, Evan, why don't you review the process then for the public to uh, comment uh, can you run through that again for us? Uh, sure. Anybody that would like to participate, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, there is a reactions button with a smiley face. If you press that, the bottom most option is the raise your hand function. You can also indicate in the chat that you would like to participate. And if you are calling in, you can press star, star nine uh, to raise your hand and indicate that you would like to participate. Uh, looks like we have... One member of the public already, uh, Britton um, Miller. Uh, Evan, can, um, uh, can I interrupt for, very quickly for one second? Uh, Dennis has been doing some quick math and he reports that 68% 60, of the plants are, are actually native. So, um, no, say, that's good to hear, but as I said, it doesn't change our pledge to continue working with your staff, but you know, it is a significant difference between 50 and 68, and we just wanted to pass that along. And then now we can get to the public, and I apologize for interrupting. No, that's um, it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Evan, uh, so who's up first? Uh, Britton Miller. Um, hi, everyone. It's Britton Miller. I'm at 252 Shore Drive in Bramford, and uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this process. Um, I want to thank Thank you for the follow-up um, requesting information about uh, putting imposing limitations on traffic on 142. And um, I guess I have a couple of questions related to that. Um, one is uh, uh, whether or not something happens with Tweed, um, you know, uh, I guess that's not really um, my uh, biggest concern. I was I would really love to see us restrict large truck traffic on 142 now. And I, one of my questions for the Amazon folks is whether or not uh, there would be any reason for the large delivery uh, semi-trucks to um, 
use our our route. So that's one uh, question that I had, um, and I'm wondering if we could go on and put a limitation on now. Uh, I mean, why why do we need to wait? Uh, it's the it's a 25 mile an hour speed limit. It's curvy. The houses are close together. Visibility is poor. People are already speed through the area and uh, a lot of children, pets, walkers. And so I, I would love to see that request happen uh, with the application to uh, OSTA for the traffic. So I would love to see if that's possible. Um, and also, um, also uh, Mr. Liguri's um, comment, I hope you got, got your name right, um, about can Amazon uh, make any, uh, request to their own drivers, uh, for example, not to use 142 at, for through traffic. Obviously local deliveries, I appreciate that, that we're gonna have van traffic and we do now as uh, Mr. Nuff had indicated uh, one of the earlier meetings, but I would love to see if there was a way to uh, have Amazon restrict use of our uh, road to, um, to local deliveries only. That's all I had. Thank you very much. Dr. Anders here. Thank you, uh, Ms. Miller. And uh, are, are there, before we get a response, are there others that wish to comment? Evan, do you see anyone? Uh, I do not see anyone at this time, but I would like to just reiterate, uh, if you'd like to participate, please use the raise your hand function uh, or indicate in the chat that you would like to participate. Looks like uh, Mr. Savino. Oh, actually, it's Josephine Savino. I'm so sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I live at 12 Midwood Road in Short Beach. And the concern that I have, um, Britton, thank you very much. I have the same concern. I live right off Short Beach Road, one house in. Uh, and that's been a very big concern of mine. But the other concern that I have is still the traffic on Route 1. Um, I use 53 to go to work and come home every day. The traffic studies that you have been alluding to, tw uh, 2016, we also have now Aldi's and Chase coming. So that's gonna change the traffic tremendously. So are any other traffic studies going to be done once Aldi's and Chase opens. My concern is that it's already difficult for me to get to work the way it is right now. And both of those businesses have not opened up yet. So my concern is, are you really taking that into consideration for traffic study? All I heard was 2016. I did not hear anything else about what's happening now. What is going to happen when that, when those two businesses open? You haven't, you haven't really spoken about that. And that is my concern because I live here. I live in Short Beach. And I think you all need to understand that, that there's many of us here in Short Beach. We love where we live. We love our neighborhood. We love being able to walk on our street. We love being able to walk to the beach. But what you're doing right now is really affecting our quality of life. So you really need to address what is gonna happen traffic wise. You know, speed seems to be the elephant in the room. So really, me as a citizen, first time I've ever spoken at one of these events. I really need to understand what you're doing to help us in the neighborhood. I mean, I just find it very difficult to understand why Amazon would want to build there when there's no north ramp to go north. I, I, I just can't understand that. I would think they would want to find a place that is more convenient for their trucks to go on and off the highway. Because the only way to get to us, to get through from, even if Tweed does happen with their tractor trailers is through
through Short Beach Road the, the quickest way. So that is, that's, it's just my logical way of thinking, sitting here and listening to this. So as a citizen, I'm concerned for the welfare of my neighborhood that I've been here for many, many years and that I really cherish. So that's what I'm asking you. Chuck Inchner, thank you, Ms. Savino. Um, I think the, uh, the again, the, I think the applicant addressed that. I think the, the main question that have you accounted for the all these and Chase Bank traffic? I think you have addressed that at prior hearings, but it would be helpful to emphasize that again. I would uh, like to hear that. Yeah, the, we'll, we'll ask. We're going to get to the public point, and then we're going to ask the 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 applicant to respond. Okay, here. thank you. You bet. Um, and uh, who's up next? Um, uh, Evan? Uh, Nancy P. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Nancy Peniston. I live very nearby uh, on Cherry Hill Road uh, in Brantford, and I'm also very concerned about the traffic that this is going to bring to our small town, and I don't understand why they want to build here, actually, but my question is, um, was the summer traffic concern uh, brought into any of the uh, uh, engineering plans? And, and was that looked at at all, the, the amount of summer traffic we have, which begins in May and goes right into October? Um, and uh, uh, I, just, I, I just don't understand how these trucks are going to uh, with the traffic we have already at that in that area, and um, anyway, I my my question is: Was the summer summer traffic concert uh, taken into consideration at all? Um, I'm I'm very concerned about my quality of life here in Bradford with Amazon coming in with all this traffic. But okay, thank you, uh, Chuck Anderson. Thank you, Nancy. I think that that issue was. I, well, we'll ask the applicant's traffic expert. I, I, we we ask that question as well, but I, and, okay. and we'll we'll have we'll have them respond to that again. Who's up next? Uh, next up is Shirley McCarthy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Just a uh, few comments. Uh, being on the Brantford Forest Commission, I'm delighted that you're going to increase the number of natives. Uh, being chair of the Brantford Clean Energy Committee, I'm a bit disappointed that there are no concrete plans for renewable energy installation, given your sustainable website says your goals are 100% renewable power by 2025. But hopefully you'll work on that. And then finally, I just want to say that I do support this project because it's an example of smart development. Smart development is developing where you're not destroying wildlife habitat, you're not mowing down a forest. It's just asphalt up there. So I think it is a good example of smart development. Thank you. Chuck to share. Thank you, Ms. McCart. Uh, Evan, anyone else? I uh, do not see anyone at this time, but I would like to just one more time remind everybody the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, and you can use the raise your hand function uh, to indicate you would like to participate. Okay, thank you. At this point, then, let's go back then, uh, Chuck Anders, Chair, go back to the applicant. Uh, can the applicant respond to these? Uh, there are a number of questions from the public. I think some of them have been brought up before, but um, uh, can you uh, address those? And I'll... Uh, why don't you, I'll let you go first, and if I have some follow-up, I'll, I'll ask. Sure, happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and, and I don't know if, if Ms. Miller or Savino you know, were able to attend uh, or watch any other hearings, but um, let me address um, Ms. Savino first. You know, she indicated that she um, travels on Route 1 whenever she goes to or from work, and, and, and most importantly is that 
that is when we were making sure that our vans are not on the road. And we, we've detailed in, 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 and frankly, in great detail, um, the times of day when our vans will be uh, leaving the site and then returning in a specific attempt to stay off of the road at the time that you're going to and from work. So that's, that's the first answer. And yes, and we are very careful in making sure that we included the traffic from Chase and Aldi's um, as well as any other development. Um, you know, for those of us who live in this world, um, you know, we, we take some things for granted, but one of the requirements that any traffic engineer must do um, and when proposing a traffic study is not only to account for the traffic or, uh, being created by the proposed development, but also before doing uh, the full traffic analysis is to find out what other projects are coming online in the near future. So that traffic can, can be accounted for as well. So uh, I can absolutely assure you that uh, the traffic from Chase and Aldi's has been included in our traffic reports. Uh, our, our traffic expert, Rob Blotterman, us spent a fair amount of time running through all the various scenarios and your own, when I say your own, the commission's own traffic engineer has reviewed those scenarios um, uh, closely as well. So yes, we have accounted for um, all the traffic from all the existing traffic as well as uh, traffic um, arising from proposed developments in the area. Um, you should also note that our traffic counts have been approved by OSTA. So we've already taken that first step as Rob has indicated multiple times, you have the benefit of BL companies doing the initial traffic report, Bob's sort of internal, third, Rob's internal uh, review, uh, sort of a third party review. You have uh, Steve Ullman doing a, another review and then you have OSTA as your, as your fourth level of review. Um, in terms of you know, prophylactically uh, eliminating traffic from, from 142, um, you know, I, I certainly can understand how you know, Tweed has become, you know, sort of the elephant in the room, but there is no intent, no desire to utilize Tweed for the purpose of delivering products to our site. I, and I'm only saying this to be candid, should that happen in the future, 20 years from now, I, don't, I wanna make sure that, um, you know, I, no one could say, well, you never said never. Um, I mean, certainly there's no intent, no plan to do that. As we are, as we have articulated, as our memo has, has indicated, as your own town attorney has indicated, there's a full opportunity for um, your local traffic authority working with OSTA and through OSTA to address that issue. Um, certainly there is no authority to try to um, preclude traffic by, you know, by, there's no ability by a commission to preclude traffic from certain roads where it's not proposed uh, as part of the original application. Um, to the extent that, that our delivery vans may travel down 142, 142 is a state road. Uh, you know, there is an, you know, everyone gets to drive down a road, whether it's a town road or state road. And, you know, our drivers, as well as, you know, um, you know local residents, as well as those maybe trying to avoid a, a traffic jam someplace can use, you know, a town or state road um, at their will. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I think there was a summer traffic question. What about increased oh. for summer traffic? Uh, let me see. Yes, uh, I've been told by Rob Botromitis that our uh, traffic study uh, did apply a seasonal factor. So yes, um, the increase in traffic in the summertime uh, has been accounted for in our, in our traffic study. That's my recollection that he, uh, he added a, a, a percentage to account for that, but uh, yep, I don't. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, in the question that I heard Bruce Miller say, and I was, do you, do you, do you know if, just talk about tractor trailers, forget the delivery vans, but, but do the tractor trailers now use 142? Even, I, I don't know. I, I, I think your answer to that, as I understood it, says, look at, if there's a, because presumably the objection isn't just to Amazon, tractor trailers is to any tractor trailers. Uh, and, and so, because, you know, that, that's the problem, that's a potential nuisance. And my understanding was if that's a problem for any tractor trailers, whether it's Amazon or anyone else, uh, Walmart, Walmart's up there, they have tractor trailers, they have deliveries as well. And if they want to go on 142, I mean, they, I think what you're saying is that, um, you know, what you, the remedy is to, if we think it's a problem, 
is to petition OSTA to, it's not planning zoning, it's the local traffic authority to petition OSTA to put a restriction in uh, that, that no large, you know, prohibiting large truck traffic from going on there. Um, although I don't know if you, I, I don't know, does Amazon ever voluntarily say, okay, we don't want your guys, you know, your tractor trailers, do you guide the routes uh, from, you know, from, from your tractor trailers? I, I don't even know how that works. Well, I, I, I believe our traffic study indicates that the, the tractor trailers will be coming to and from I-95, um, and, and which, which, which clearly makes sense. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's what I would, that's what I would think. I would think even, you know, God forbid, it doesn't look like it ever happened, but it happened in Tweed, you would go from Tweed, you'd go up whatever it is, Hemingway Avenue, and you'd go on a 95 and get off at exit 53 and 54. I mean, that, that's to me, the, the route you would go because you would, otherwise you'd be running through not just Short Beach, but lots of residential areas right. in East Haven and, and uh, Brantford, uh, you know, that's, it'd be pretty bad, but, uh, you know, so, so, so to be clear, our, our track, our tractor trailers will be coming from Windsor, North Haven and Wallingford. So okay. all accessible from, from interstate 95. Right. Uh, right. Okay. I, I, I mean, I mean, so long as we're, we're using, you know, metaphors and the elephant in the room, I mean, the use of 142 for tractor trailers, the, the better metaphor is, you know, um, you know, being struck by lightning, the same person, you, you, you were talking about something that is, 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 it is so unlikely that is sort of taking, you know, um, it, it's sort of an outsized concern, given how unlikely it is. Okay. Okay. Um, I do say, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask, we'll allow Ms. Miller, to, if she has a follow-up, I see her hand raised. So, um, why, Evan, do you, you uh, want to? Uh, sure, go ahead, Ms. Miller. Hi, um, well, thanks for that uh, information. <clears throat> I guess um, my question to the commission is um, uh, what other options might neighbors have outside of these hearings? I appreciate that it, it looks like this will be outside of the scope of this, but um, uh, I'm just wondering what other options neighbors might have to help with uh, reduce, with really looking at uh, traffic in our area. My understanding is that Robin Comey has gotten approval for a traffic study on 142. So I think we would stick with our state rep to see what we can do because I, um, you know, it, it is a problem and with a large facility coming in, I appreciate that it'd be unlikely for the semis to be going down our road under normal circumstances. Um, I just soon, you know, uh, have that something that just wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, just make that restriction. So um, is that my understanding that, that that will not be considered as part of this application? It, 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 yeah, but no, I, under, it, I, I don't think the commission has authority to restrict as a condition so you can't put a truck, that, that's not this. I mean, condition. you wouldn't be able to request that that be part of the traffic uh, review that OSTA does looking at this project um, under the circumstances. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the I, 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 I suppose our local traffic authority is the OSA contact could, could, could request that. I mean, okay. that, that's not really specific to this project though, it sounds like. It sounds like the concern is is any truck traffic. Well, it's, traffic it really. started out looking at this project, obviously it sort of sure. highlights highlights the potential um, but uh, that's, that gives me the information I need. So the next step right. is to talk with the traffic authority then. Yes. All right. Okay, Th thank, thank you. you. Um, uh, anything else from the applicant or Quish, uh, well, applicant, uh, any other comments you wanna make before we close this public hearing? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, other than to thank the commission and the staff for its diligence and its um, cooperation and the generosity of your time and thoughts. Um, you know, we think we have a really terrific project. You know, we have given you an extensive memo at the very beginning of this process of how we comply with all the, your special exception criteria. Uh, I'll allow you to uh, read that at, at your leisure. 
Um, but I, I think, you know, returning to where we started on the very first nights, this is going to be a really dramatic improvement to your grand list. Not that that's a entirely relevant criteria for you, but this is a site that's been vacant for decades. I mean, think about that for decades. This is a prime site next to 95 that's been vacant for decades, which is frankly staggering. Um, we're going to be offering a number of, of uh, op employment opportunities, uh, huge support for local business, and we try to take into account every traffic scenario, every impact on traffic, um, and, have, and we try to be as responsive as possible uh, to all the requests by staff and commission. And so uh, we appreciate um, your, your time and attention, and we obviously re respectfully request uh, your vote to approve. Thank you. Chuck Andrews here. Thank you, Mr. Knopf. Any questions, comments from, our, from commission members or staff before we close this? Yeah, Massimo Liguori. Uh, quick question uh, for uh, Mr. Nuff, please. Um, Mr. Nuff, um, I mean, just to kind of keep it like, you know, blunt, straight out forward, um, I, I haven't really gotten an answer. Uh, like, can Amazon just put ease onto the um, residents of the town of Bradford and just say, you know, I know we have to go through what we have to go through state levels, but can Amazon just restrict that? And if not, is it because it's a third party? Um, just a, you know, no, straightforward and, and, um, question. Uh, and, uh, hopefully keep, get a straightforward answer. No, keep in mind, we're, we're talking about two different types of trucks. There's tractor trailers and there's vans. Uh, tractor the van, trailers. Okay, so, so tractor trailers, um, they're going to go, they're going to take the most efficient routes. The most efficient route from those three facilities, larger Amazon facilities, is on 95. Um, you know, could there be an accident? Could there be a weather situation? Could there be whatever? Um, but they're not going to go um, dramatically out of their way in a less efficient manner to come to this last mile facility. So um, yes, I think Amazon has the ability to direct their drivers to take the, the, the most efficient. And, um, you know, obviously has will have the least impact environmentally if you take the most efficient path to this to the last mile facility and and that's the that's the direction they'll receive so yeah so like if you're at tweed airport and um i'm a tractor trailer driver and i put in my navigation uh you know um to, to your new location it's going to my navigation is going to tell me to go through short beach um, these tractor trailer drivers are going to take the shortest route if they pick something up from Amazon in the future. And um, I mean, if if we could, if Amazon could just, you know, put ease to the public and say, you know what, uh, we won't use that route um, and, and let their tractor trailer drivers know. And I think that would relieve a lot of tension uh, for the future um, if they're capable to do that. I mean, because if you're at Tweed and you put in your navigation, uh, Commerce Parkway, you're going to go through. Um, that's where it's going to take you, to Shore Beach. Um, and I can understand their concern. I don't live in the Shore Beach area, but man, we got to be concerned for each other. And uh, just out of courtesy, um, I mean, can that restriction be put in uh, by Amazon? Um, and then, of course, we'll do our due diligence with the state and hopefully, um, you know, have no trucks go through that area ever. But um, I, I just think as courtesy, um, you know, again, you're right. You're, you're the most efficient route is going to be going to the highway. But if someone puts in their navigation, that's where it's going to take you. You but know, only, and only I, if you're only if your point of origin is Tweed. We do not propose right. a point of origin from Tweed. This is something no. that is is not even on the table. It's not in the room. It's not in the building. It's not in the neighborhood. Yeah. So that restriction should be pretty simple. No. It, it, it's not something that's that's relevant at this time, and and there's there there is there is a clear opportunity and a clear path and a clear procedure for the town to deal with that eventuality, if and if and when it should come to pass. Okay, I just wanted to throw it out there. Possible. Any, Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Any any further comments? Uh, I would like to point out that a member of the public would like to make a comment. Is this Kate Galambos? She hasn't spoken yet? Yes, it's Kate. Okay. Uh, Kate, I wish you... <laughs> I, uh, okay, sure. Kate, what do you got? 
Uh, is it okay if I speak or not? Yeah, I, I, we, we closed the public comments. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize that. Did you, did you not hear, did, would, I, I don't want to be a jerk either, but I mean, did, did you not hear that or? or I, I was, no. I was probably working on the spreadsheet trying to figure out why there's a discrepancy in the traffic report. Is this the same question you raised last time? Uh, not exactly. Uh, I'll just go real quickly, if you don't mind. Sure, what is it? I, I comparing the numbers uh, from the table that I showed last e uh, week with the traffic report that was submitted in the main documentation, looking at the AM peak hour, which I believe uh, Mr. Knopf said was 7 to 9 AM, the PM peak hour, and the Saturday peak. And it's, I don't understand why the numbers in the traffic report do not correspond with the numbers in the 24 hour um, report. And my other question is that if the largest amount of traffic is between 10 and 11 a.m., and it looks like there would be 245 trips between 10 and 11 a.m., I think all of those cars would have to get through that one intersection to get either from the facility or to the facility. So maybe Mr. Ullman could help me understand how that could be possible in that intersection to handle 245 cars in an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, okay, there, there's a couple of specific, specific Mr. Knopf, do you, uh, or Miss Hugh, you're talking about one If if yeah. I could, and and, and listen, I, I I fully understand your generosity in allowing the public to speak. I mean, right. can candidly, after the time it was closed on issues that are not new. I mean, I I think the questions we've asked, we we've answered it. I think Mr. Ullman has answered it. Um, I think we're sort of at the point of um, belaboring this. So if you really want us to answer it, I mean, we can, but I, I think we've done so. Okay. If your answer is you think you've done so, then I know you addressed something earlier and, and the point, the question is on the record. So we'll, we'll look at it again. We'll, we'll, we can ask our own traffic guy after the close of the hearing. Uh, uh, so we can continue if, if we have some further questions. I know that you did address the 10 and 11 issue. The specific question is how you get 245. But again, I think our own experts said that because of the drop off, the significant drop off, the 245 still works. Your guys have said you're still at level of service B between 10 and 11. You said that earlier this evening. So is that what you mean by you think you've answered the question? Indeed, yes. Okay, so then we'll just close this then. Uh, Thank you. Thank, thank, and, and but the the questions on the record, we can look further to see if we have any further questions. So and, and and okay. So thank you. With that, uh, any other uh, uh, co comments from commission members? Uh, yeah, Marcy Pelosi. I just want to confirm something very simply, which I think I know the answer to. But the three larger uh, centers that the trucks are coming from would bring the tractor trailers up. From New Haven on 95? No, so, uh, Windsor, North Haven, and Wallingford. So they're coming down 91 and up 95 North, getting on off 53. And then when they leave, they would be going back to the 53 exit, right? So that yes. so, so they don't they won't be driving between exit 53 and 54, which I think is a really important point to be clear about. And then I guess just to be specific, because I understand what you were saying about the reduction of traffic between that eight and 10 period and how that works. But I was just curious in that period that people are worried about how many tractor trailer trucks would be coming in that period if you could give me an estimate. I, I think the number was seven and for a total of 14 trips. Is that correct, Rob? Um, so, for, for, your, for the record, Rob Boltramitis. So, you know, based, based on the distribution prepared by Amazon, you know, tractor trailers are, um, there's a total of 28 in, in a single day. That's 14 entering, 14 leaving. 
Um, and it's really happening e evenly throughout the day. So, so any one hour is unlikely to have more than say one, two or three tractor trailers. Okay, and you've, right, because I've, I've heard that you've gone to great lengths to stagger it around the busy times and, and all that. So I'm just trying to understand visually what we might see because we'll clearly see a few more tractor trailers, but it sounds like we're gonna see maybe one an hour. Is that a That would fair? be correct. That, okay. that very fair. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Anderson, share anything else from the commission or staff? Okay, so then we will close this matter as a public hearing. We thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Do you want to take a break now, guys? Or do you want to go on to the next one? Either way. Um, I say we go on. Okay, yeah, let's, let's go on. Moving. Let's keep Sweet moving. Up. Okay. <laughs> We'll go on to items number three and four. That's the 61 Bourbon Associates, 61 Bourbon Drive PDD Master Plan Multifamily Residential Development. That's the uh, the uh, the conversion reuse of the old hospice uh, monastery for a residential uh, uh, elderly development. Uh, and it's the PDD Master Plan and the PDD Site Plan CAM. For the multifamily residential development. Is the applicant ready to proceed with that? We are, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, for the record, my name is John Nuff. I'm an attorney with an office at 147 Broad Street in Milford, and I'm here tonight on of the applicant and the owner of the property S61 Bourbon. Uh, there was a lot of um, you know, comments that we had received from your staff. We had responded in a sort of cursory fashion. When we opened the hearing, uh, we've had the opportunity over these past several weeks to uh, respond in a uh, much more robust fashion. And uh, so we are we have our entire team here to to do so. I would tell you that um, we have responded in a positive fashion to all of your staff comments. We have received our WPCA approval. We have submitted our traffic study. We have we have submitted our updated stormwater report. We have responded to comments. Uh, from Jamie Frederick, your inland wetland officer, with regard to the uh, the path connecting the open space areas, um, we're going to have John Crude here to provide you with a rendering of the smallest uh, residential unit. Uh, we responded to uh, staff comments about your comprehensive plan and whether there's other opportunities or other uh, zones in the town that um, that could accommodate this proposed use, and we're happy to go through all those things, but. Um, you know, I, I want to reiterate, this is a really wonderful adaptive reuse of an existing building. We are not proposing any expansion of any kind. This is a wonderful um, opportunity to provide true affordable housing. We have, we have agreed to 10% uh, of our units to be um, uh, deeded as affordable, but they also are affordable just from a market standpoint. And, and that's, that's our goal, to create a really lovely, wonderful community on this really special piece of property on a nice, quiet residential street for people who are 55 and older um, and who will have, you know, who becomes who will become members of a community if they're not already members of your community. You know, people choosing to downsize from their single family homes into, um, you know, this sort of uh, community where, you know, you know, there's studios and one bedrooms, um, you know, inexpensive, whether they are deeded affordable or not and uh, creates a really nice opportunity for people to, to remain in the town of Brantford should they so choose. Um, so with that, I, I think it probably makes the most sense to turn this over to Todd. He can walk you through all the changes, in particular, you know, the landscape plan, I think the photometric plan uh, that respond to the comments that have been provided by uh, Harry and Evan. Todd? Thanks. For the record, uh, Todd Ritchie, professional engineer, state of Connecticut, and also board certified environmental engineer with SLR Consulting out of Cheshire. Um, let me start with the site plan. Just some of the comments that we had received that uh, Mr. Nuff already mentioned. Um, let me just get this off the screen, sorry. Um, regarding the path from um, that we, we have a sidewalk from Bourbon Drive uh, that goes and we'll have an easement for passage uh, 
across this uh, down the sidewalk, which will be a concrete sidewalk with a curb. We'll have a crosswalk here, a continuation of the easement. And then we had originally had a stone dust path, which we've now uh, provided asphalt pavement path uh, uh, from along this uh, section here to provide more stability, uh, prevent erosion, uh, and obviously minimize long-term maintenance. Um, we've also updated our sedimentation erosion control plans to uh, provide some additional erosion controls in this area as uh, recommended by the uh, wetlands agent. Um, we did do um, we did add the uh, bicycle rack at the entrance as requested, which is loca located here. Um, we did on our own kind of revise and add more uh, handicap accessible um, parking spaces, uh, just taking into account um, accessibility of the units uh, and wanting to make sure that there was an, uh, plenty of spaces to be provided. So we've added three more handicap accessible spaces in this location here, uh, which with the um, accessible aisles resulted in a reduction of total overall spaces by one, but we still had uh, excessive number of spaces uh, or number of spaces that exceeded the minimum requirement. Um, I think that was noted in our uh, email uh, summary. Um, I'm just trying to think, let me just go through the uh, rest of what we had here, uh, bike rack. Um, curb ramps will be ADA compliant. We do show, uh, call them out that way and show them in the detail. Um, we had a couple of traffic questions that were re responded to. And I think that went into detail at uh, the last hearing uh, regarding sight lines and traffic. Um, stormwater drainage report was, um, there's a few comments on that that we resubmitted and were uh, accepted by the town engineer. And I'll just kind of um, show the updated uh, landscaping plan. Sorry, skipping over it. Here it is. Um, which is, you know, provided more robust planting across the site uh, and in the areas of the sort of community engagement area up front, as we would probably expect it to be and continue to be. Um, so they would be replanting of that area and uh, beautifying that area, as well as the areas of the courtyards around the building and foundation plantings as well around the building. Um, so there's the expanded plan as, as far as that goes. Um, there's a lot of detailed planting, uh, plant list um, as well, um, native species uh, focus um, and trees, uh, trees being more so in the um, parking areas to provide shade and you know minimize impact from sort of heat island effects. We do have somewhat of a canopy over the existing driveway and so on. I don't know if there's any questions on that. Um, I could jump ahead to the photometric plan. This was providing by, provided by Apex Lighting, a lighting representative. Um, we have, we did document all the existing light sources on the building and their heights. Uh, we will, will be replacing those sources as you can see all the way around the building at these locations here. Um, with new lighting, uh, LED style lighting. Um, and the, you could see the, uh, the, the projection areas in these circles from the building here. And then we also have the pole mounted lighting and the projection area, light projection areas shown in these areas and all along the uh, access driveway and also you know, along the building in this area here. Uh, all of the lighting will be LED style um, Black uh, dark sky compliant, full cutoff um, with uh, the light source not visible and max, max uh, 3000 Kelvin. We did provide specifications for the lighting as well. There will be some bollard lighting in the courtyard areas to complement those, uh, you know, those amenities. I don't know if there's any questions. Thanks, Todd. Um... Why don't we have John Cruitt show the uh, the rendering of the of the the smallest of the units, and then he can s sort of walk the commission through that, and we can get to uh, you know some of the the other sort of uh, larger planning issues. For the record, my name is John Cruitt. I am the project's architect. 
Uh, my practice is in Guilford, Connecticut. What I'm going to show you uh, is the smallest of the units where there was a bit of a question in the past public hearing. Uh, it's the unit that basically is a 375 square foot unit and give me a chance to just share my screen and I will turn my machine. Okay. Okay. This, the units are all located along this greenhouse like existing structure, which gives us the opportunity to have nat natural light coming in from a skylight type structure. This is a plan of the uh, of that 375 square foot unit uh, showing the living sleeping area, the kitchen, the bath. The bath is based upon an accessible uh, either type A or type B unit. Uh, we show a dinette table with uh, seating for three. We show a sofa, which could easily be a convertible sofa for, for, so for living and sleeping. We show a full service kitchen uh, with a washer dryer unit. So basically this is a 375 square foot unit. Uh, adequate uh, closet and storage facilities. And we also have a rendering of that unit because this faces an existing garden-like landscape. We have a sliding door, which gives us a view, a nice view of that existing courtyard. And you can kind of see pretty much an example of how this unit might furnish. The other thing worth noting that adds to the spaciousness of this unit is this existing uh, cathedral ceiling, which I plan to reuse in the design of this unit. So this is what this uh, smallest unit looks like. It's 375 square feet living, sleeping area, dining, dinette, uh, kitchen, and bathroom. It's a fully self-contained unit. It's very livable and usable by at least uh, one resident. And that's probably who's going to be leasing uh, this apartment. So that pretty much is my response to that inquiry regarding the smallest of these units. There are 12 of these units uh, in the complex and the rest of the units, of course, are, are larger and are varying uh, degrees of uh, layouts. Some have one bedroom, some are larger studios. Uh, I went through some of these in my last presentation in the last public hearing. So, Basically, I hope that I have convinced you uh, as a zoning board that these units are very workable, they are very livable, and certainly they'll be very rentable and certainly well within the realm of uh, what is required in an affordable housing unit and was expected. So I'd be more than willing to entertain any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, you know, a few things just to reiterate, and I know it's been a while since since this application has been back before the commission, is that you know we are we have been we are proposing significant stormwater improvements where candidly we are not required to do so. We went through a lengthy uh, wetland process where the wetland commission was ultimately, I think, um, very pleased with the our, our proposed um, uh, drainage improvements. Um, you know, we're in an R four zone where the uh, minimum uh, square footage of a lot is 20,000 square feet. Now, Todd hasn't laid out what a subdivision of this property would be, but I know we talked, you know, folks have talked about impacts. I, I would tell you, that if you put several single family homes and maybe a swimming pool or two, there will be far greater neighborhood impacts from those several single family homes than, than the residents in this existing 59 units 
um, residential building. Um, so, you know, if we have reached out to our neighbors, our closest abutting neighbors, and we believe that we have uh, accommodated their um, preferences. Um, so, you know, we'd be happy to answer any questions. You know, my guess is that I don't know whether Harry and Evan have had the opportunity to uh, review in any detail our response memo that we submitted uh, some time ago. Um, you know, and you know, they raised some uh, some zoning issues about the question of density in a cam zone. Um, you know, candidly, you know, we didn't think a CAM application was required because uh, it, we felt it met an exception. Nonetheless, we submitted a CAM application at the staff's request. There's a provision in your regulations that says you shouldn't use a PDD in the CAM zone for, for, the, for an increase in density. And our response was that we're proposing 59 units in the existing building. This is not a density issue. This is not as if we're trying to build a bigger building on a small piece of part, on a small piece of land, the building exists. Whether we had five units, fifty-nine units, or anywhere in between, the impact on the environment and the cam zone would be absolutely identical. Absolutely identical. So, um, at this point, you know, you know, I, I think I need both times to respond to commission questions and, and allow uh, Harry to, you know, run through his report. Uh, Chuck Kane is here. Thank you, Mr. Nuff. Uh, Harry and Evan, well, well, one question just on the size of the units. And I, I'm not sure about this because I, I printed out, I printed out the sheet and it, the print's too tiny. I'm looking at sheet A4 and it, I can't tell if the size of the, there's, it looks like it, this is the uh, enlarged plan, second floor west. And I, I, I may be just reading it, but I didn't know if the, if the size was 330 units versus 375. I, so the question is, looked like there were a couple 330, if, but maybe I'm misreading that. Is that right? Or is that, in which case that, that would be the smallest, although there's only two of them. John, can you answer that? And you're muted. Yeah, uh, yeah John's muted, yeah. John Crow, you're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> um, Harris with Town Planner. Uh, John, you are you should be able to mute. There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah, for some reason somebody muted me and I, I couldn't get back on and I got this dialogue box, but I'm back. Uh, I am looking at sheet A4 on the second floor. And indeed, there are a couple of units there that are 330 square feet. Uh, I wasn't concerned about these units so much because of the shape of the unit. Uh, it seems to lend itself to a sleeping alcove and some area where uh, it's possible to lay out a living room and kitchen area. And there is a closet that is conveniently located right beyond the main entrance of the unit. So I wasn't really concerned about the livability of these units. Uh, I believe they are. I believe there's plenty of space in these. Many of the efficiency units that I've designed on other projects have been pretty much in this ballpark. So I feel this is a very livable, rentable unit. And if they're not, no one will rent them. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting that the legislature is, is frowning upon having minimum square footages for apartments because it affects their affordability and uh, outside the context of 830G, just whether or not they provide, um, you know, a, a affordable with a lowercase a, as, as I've referenced. Um, you know, my client is very confident that, the, that these will be rentable, that, you know, people will be um, intrigued and very much like the community that will be created there. You know, that they're devoting, you know, a significant amount of space to community areas. Obviously the, the exterior um, is, is a nice attraction for them as well. Um, so, it, and based upon uh, his experience with, you know, other rental units, they're very confident that that people will be interested in, in these smaller units and the, the price point that they'll they'll be able to offer. And and should they not be? No one's at the worst. Uh, no, Chuck answers here. No, I, I, I don't want to overregulate. And I believe, you know, generally believe let the market do it. I my my question is I asked for rendering the smallest unit and it wasn't. <laughs> it was even though it was only two, it, it right. wasn't the smallest one. So, Got it. Okay. I'm, 
Understood. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's um, turn it over to the staff uh, for any uh, staff comments. Uh, Harry and Evan. Question. Well, we're all uh, sure. sure. I count ahead. about twenty of them. How many are there? The, of the ten foot wide units, because that's a really narrow dimension, and I'm just curious why you didn't make one 20 foot wide unit in those spaces because it seems like you're running along the whole back zigzag wall like 20 units that run and i and i agree that 36 length is a good length to stack for the uses but the 10 feet is just very very narrow to work with so i'm just curious why why the wall why these you know walls, it up yeah, the size. Me, you're john, i'm john Cruitt. The answer to that is because there are existing units on site that are this wide. What I have done as best as I could was to make these units layouts more efficient such that more area would be available uh, for use as a living area and just concentrated the kitchen and, and bathroom area where it's located on the plant. And as far as the 10 foot, uh, two inch or whatever, uh, what is shown, I have to disagree. Uh, there are many spaces in these apartments that are around 10 feet or so wide. I'm, I'm sitting in a room right now that's 11 foot wide by 13 foot wide. And I'm visualizing my whole space being three of these rooms on end. And it's just extremely narrow and tight. It feels tighter than a hotel room. And these are people's year round residents. I just, it feels to me like they're trying to maximize the number of units because the demising walls and the practice of the, you know, the monastery was such that that's how spaces were divided. But when you're, when you're adaptively reusing them to something more current, I just think that the market's going to demand, you know, 700 square feet, which still is not a large apartment. I mean, most, a lot of the spaces I rent are 700 square feet and it's, it's enough for one, it's comfortable, maybe two, but I can't, you know, I, I picture half of that. And I just can't see how that's marketable. And I, you know, I'm, yeah, you can stake the project on it, but to me, it seems like there should be some connection, you know, that the it, you should be having having those units and, and having 10 instead of 20 and making a, a connection through the wall. You know, I mean, and that's my biggest issue with this project is, is those particular units, because, you know, I, and I've yet to see a breakdown of all the, the, the total unit count with square foot. I'd like to see that so that I can see, you know, what the that, total range of sizing is. And if I'm may, on the that is clearly stated on the drawings. The breakdown of the units, the square footage of each unit, the size and dimensions of the units, all you have to do is look at those drawings. I have it in front of me. I don't have, you know, that there are 20, 376 square units. I, I mean, granted, the drawing I have is November 5th. And maybe I don't have an update, but I'm just trying to, I'm going through all my papers and I don't have that update. So that's just information that would be very helpful to me to have that chart before I make a decision of that there's 10 units that are 300, you know, and 20 square feet, or are there 20? So that I can understand what the, the way that building functions. Is. It is on the drawing. John, you know, so, so we will, um, Ms. Pelosi, we will make sure that uh, Harry and Evan have the right sheet um, so that they can point you to the, um, the the breakdown of the of the types of units and their sizes. And 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 listen, we're we're not trying to be combative. Um, it's just that um, I, I I just think we're getting outside the jurisdiction of the commission to determine, you know, what frankly the market should be determining what each individual tenant will be making a decision on when he or she comes to you know, look at these units, you know, they may decide this is simply too small for me and they will go elsewhere. Um, but my client has, has experience doing this elsewhere and is confident that this is going to be, um, 
uh, a site that's going to be uh, very attractive for those 55 and older, and, and candidly, probably far in excess of 55 years old. You know, not only because of the type of community that will be created, but also, as I said, because of the price point that 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 we can uh, facilitate as a result of having 59 units as compared to having 30 units for the site. Uh, uh, Chuck Anders here. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Nuff, Marcy. Uh, let's let's go. Uh, I, other commission members may have questions, but let's run through to see if the staff has any comments from the staff report. Uh, Harry and Evan. Uh, uh, Harry, some town planner. I did this one um, just um, to sort of remind everyone about the process. Um, this is kind of a combined review of application for a plan development uh, district approval, um, which is uh, in quotes and quote, legislative function of the commission. You're acting upon an application to essentially uh, change the zoning map and uh, the regulations. So you're creating something that would apply to this particular project, this particular site. Um, that being said, there is also an associated application that is for um, a site plan CAM approval for the development itself. So often the commission is looking at application as through its so-called administrative capacity, you're looking to see if the application meets the criteria and the regulations. However, with the plan development district, your, your uh, purview is a little wider. Um, so you're looking at it more discretionary basis and considering whether it meets the plan of conservation development and whether you think it's an appropriate uh, change, frankly, to the zoning regulations um, for the wider um, area around the site as well as appropriate for the site itself. So that being said, um, there are uh, just a few things I wanna emphasize. I did a review of the new plans that were submitted last Friday. Um, but only to a certain degree could I get through the whole package. Um, I was unfortunately out of the office due to personal matter Monday. So my time was a little bit limited. Um, I will note that appreciate the offer of the pathway, which is the offer to and an easement to connect the Brantford Hills, um, the former site, the former school to the open space owned by the town to the south of this property. I think I'll just share my screen quickly, if that's okay with commission. And you should be able to see this. And it's, uh, this is from the, uh, the town's geographic information systems. This is just a map of the area. Uh, this of course is the applicant's property and project, the former hospice and the monastery site the so-called Lions Park. There's another little layout park area here and the proposed parking lot and the loading area over here. Uh, the former Branford Hills School, this is town owned property. Um, this is the, uh, the former Catholic church now operated by a different church. And this area here is town owned open space um, that is accessible off of Helen Road to private road and will be hopefully accessible if this development goes ahead and it's approved by the commission. Mm -hmm. um, it's also joining a large open space area that goes, and there's a little location map here that goes way over to state owned property, Beacon Hill, it comes out near Rose Hill Road and a very extensive wetlands area that extends down towards Short Beach. Um, so this is a very significant open space area. Um, I made a pitch previously at the, uh, earliest sessions of the public hearing for a, a wider, a little more extensive, um, if you will, open space connection. Um, part of that could occur potentially in this property would include um, a easement, a public access easement to so-called Lions Park, which my understanding historically was sort of, uh, you know, put together as a community amenity when the hospice was constructed on this property. Um, you know, a wider corridor would, require property from the adjoining church property, which is not subject to this application, um, other than for the little um, drainage improvement. Uh, so I just wanna put that out there and give some context to that connection. 
Uh, it's a beautiful piece of property here. If anyone's been out there, you can uh, overlook is a wide open field here that overlooks the wetlands and it's quite a, a vista. And in this area of town, there are really a few opportunities to enhance open space and recreation possibilities. And that's been noted in other points and other discussions, you know, the plant conservation development and other forums. Um, so I just want to reemphasize that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. Um, and just go back and highlight a couple things. Um, on the landscaping, um, I'm wondering if there are any significant trees that are posed to be removed. So that question maybe can be answered now or um, if the hearing is continued further. Um, I'd like to look myself at the existing landscaping around the building and, and see what, if they're proposing, maybe you can say if it's all gonna be ripped out and replaced. Um, a lot of it seems overgrown and maybe is not usable, uh, but maybe that could be answered on the record. Um, and of course, look at it for, you know, potential for adding natives and so forth. I would note that I think one of the budding property owners on off Helen Road requested um, some additional landscaping, though I understand part of the area he was requesting that that be uh, put in was wetlands, so that might be problematic. Um, but I did not see any landscaping imposed along his property line on the plans that were submitted Friday. Um, and I think he also was asking for a fence as well. Um, so just note that on the lighting, um, again, I haven't done a complete review, but I would note that the loading area um, to, and maybe I can certainly pull the plans up possibly, uh, but just maybe I should do that. Um, bear with me for a moment. Um, so you should be able to see this cover sheet of the plan package, blow that up a little bit. Um, let's see if I can get to the lights, if I get the lighting. I don't know if the lighting is in this plan set, maybe it's an added sheet, but I'll just say right here is a loading area. Um, and there's an existing driveway that comes off Bourbon Drive and the main driveway of course is over here. Uh, there's an abundant property owner here. Um, this area is, is overlit in terms of the requirements of the regulations. I'm certainly concerned about that as well as the impact on adjoining property owners. So that will have to be looked at. Um, and the height of the fixtures as they mounted on the building. Um, in general, it looks like the landscape, I mean, the lighting plan, it does, I think, the rest of the property meet the lighting levels on the ground. But I'll have to look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, I have a couple of questions about the apartment size and, and one is about storage for the units. Um, and maybe someone can answer whether there is storage will be available on the property with these being marketed to age 55 plus population. Certainly in my lifetime, um, I've acquired many items um, and moving around, um, you know, at some point you do downsize, but people do have stuff. And with the small size units, some of them being proposed where people might store excess personal belongings, I'd be curious about how that would work on the project. Um, I would note, I think maybe Attorney Nuff mentioned this already, the WPCA has uh, given a conditional approval for this um, in terms of the sewer connection. Um, there are some items that need to be dealt with, but I think that could be uh, if the commission chose to approve this application, the condition of approval. Um, and I'm also wondering which of the units would be affordable. Would it just be the smaller size units or would there be a mix of the units and how that would work? Um, and again, just note that probably would have to, uh, if the uh, public hearing closes tonight, which it would have to, I understand without an additional um, offer of a time extension, uh, probably would have to submit some revised comments at the close of the public hearing to which the applicant would not be able to respond. So I think I'll stop there um, and stop sharing as well. Chuck Anders Chair, thank you, Harry. Um, any questions, comments from commission members before we open up the public? I have a comment, Massimo Liguori. Massimo. Yeah. Um, so um, 
uh, to John Nuff and, uh, and, and his client. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that you guys were accommodating to your surrounding neighbors um, on, on this particular project. Um, it seemed like um, you guys kind of corresponded with everybody and tried to make things really reasonable for everybody. So I, uh, I commend you on that. Um, I also, you know, I'm looking at the space of these apartments and, uh, you know, I went from three kids to, to, to one in my own house. I want to downsize, uh, you know, uh, you know, at least half of my house. And, you know, with the times of what happened over the last two years, um, there's a lot of widows out there and they do need, um, you know, maybe a smaller place and they live on their own. And um, I could see that working out for somebody. I try to put myself in that position and uh, I could see, I, I would be all right with a, with a smaller unit, less cleaning as a man, maybe a little older. Um, you know, I, I could see that being very comfortable for myself. Um, I don't see many issues with that. There may be a little storage issues, which, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, rented some places that were very small and they had uh, separate storage closets, you know, uh, downstairs uh, from from the rental units or something like that. Very small, um, but but they you know they accommodated some extra storage things. Um, those are on vacation, but you know, just an idea. But um, you know, the size of the units. Um, you know, if I was a single man, I think I'd be comfortable in a smaller size like that. I think it's laid out very very well. Um, I don't really see much of an issue with it myself. I would I would live there if I, if my uh, if I was single or or a widow or something. Um, I like the plans. Um, I like the way you designed it, and um, I just kind of wanted to throw that comment out there for you guys. So thank you. Chuck Anderson here. Thank you, Massimo. Anyone else before we open it up? Hearing none. Well, let's open it up to the public, Massimo. Just remind people what they need to do. I mean, uh, um, excuse me, Evan, sorry. <laughs> I know you, man. That's right. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that the reactions button with the smiley face down at the bottom of your screen, once you click that, the bottom option is to raise your hand. Please use this function to indicate you'd like to participate. You can also use the chat feature to indicate that you would like to speak. And I would like to point out to the commission members that uh, an adjacent neighbor named Timothy Hunt uh, is unable to speak, but he has uh, left quite a few comments and questions into the uh, chat that I th think you should all uh, read through quickly. Um, but at this time, it does not look like anybody would like to participate. Oh, here we go. Quentin can. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I just wanted to give a couple comments, make it quick. I know last time I spoke rather in depth, uh, giving a bit of a, of a review of the neighborhood and sort of a historical background of my opinions on things here. And I do stand by those comments. However, I have had further positive interaction with the developer and um, I am willing to, I think that Mr. Smith had mentioned uh, my, some of my concerns that I had voiced in the past, uh, not being on the uh, current drawings, and I would be willing to um, withdraw my request that uh, fencing and plantings be shown on the drawing uh, as a condition of approval, uh, strictly because of the difficulty in the wetlands area there. I am sensitive to that, so um, I withdraw that request. Um, based on the further interaction that I've had with the developer. <clears throat> um, I do have some conti uh, continued concerns with the lighting, uh, particularly the lights, uh, now that we saw a lighting plan tonight in the smaller park area in the Northwest corner of the parking lot. Um, there's a, I'm sorry, I don't have a way to share a screen with you showing that area, but there is that small park. Uh, it's sort of in the shape of a cross. It was showing some lighting uh, being added up in there. And one of the, the important things to me, that proximity is quite close to my property. And again, uh, my bedroom windows kind of look right out in that area. Uh, shielding any lighting um, from over there with fencing or plantings is difficult. And not only um, for lighting to me, but 
I have uh, several acres of woods to the north, uh, north of that area there. We have a lot of wildlife that habitat habitates that area, um, including nighttime species, owls, um, and species that, uh, that nest there overnight, turkey and deer especially. I wanna make sure that the wildlife isn't impacted by some of the lighting that's coming in here. And I had spoken in the past asking about whether some sort of timer uh, could be set on some of the lighting. I think particularly in that park area, it's uh, reasonable to consider that that would be used primarily um, earlier in the day, in the evening by residents. No one's gonna be walking out there probably at midnight. Um, and so if we could have some of that lighting uh, reduced to a bare minimum or shut off completely in the overnight hours, that would be really beneficial to the wildlife and to my comfort with the entire um, project. <clears throat> and I know that uh, actually I hadn't considered uh, motion sensor lighting, but it was discussed at the uh, prior applicants uh, 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 project that was discussed just uh, before this. And so motion sensing, sensor lighting could also be appropriate in some areas. Um, but if some thought could be given to that, um, and perhaps conditioned in, I think that um, that would satisfy most of my concerns other than my comments, which again, I do stand behind um, just talking about the entire compatibility of the product, uh, project um, within the neighborhood and sort of the historical use of the property. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Chuck Anders Chair, thank you, Mr. Kahn. Harry Smith Town Planner, can I interject for a second? I just want to um, possibly clarify. I think, Mr. Uh, Can, you're talking about sort of the wetland area, if you will, and there's a little uh, sort of park area. I'm sort of still getting my cursor on the screen, but I'm not sure if you're able to see the, um, the, the visual of the meeting here. Um, does that sound correct, just for the record? Um, I don't know. Is Mr. Cannon? I think he's mute. I just asked him to unmute again. There yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, you see a little bit of uh, some of those wooded areas in the wetlands yeah. in that uh, in that drawing, but uh, what's not represented is I have about two acres of uh, woods that are just north and to the northwest um, of that. In fact, on your um, GIS. Uh, drawing that yeah. you shared earlier, you were able to see a little bit better uh, where those areas are. Um, so okay. altogether, it, it comprises probably three or four acres of uh, wooded space that um, that is that habitat. So it's basically circling off the plan that's up now. I'm sort of circling my cursor in that general area. Okay. Uh, yes, more to the north and west than just to the west. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Chuck Anders Chair. Any anyone else, Evan, that wants to speak? I uh, do not see anyone else at this time, but I'd like to just reiterate the raise your hand function or indicate in the chat that you would like to speak. And again, uh, a gentleman has uh, stated uh, quite a few comments in that chat section uh, that I would like to direct the commission's attention to. Okay. I do so not see we'll anyone at this time. Okay, Excuse check me? in to share. What, the chat comments then, we'll put those into the record. So someone make a, take a picture of them or something so we make sure they're in the record and they don't just disappear from the world. So, um, so, uh, so no one else, Evan? No, no one at this time. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Nuff, any comments or responses? Uh, I guess the one issue, the main issue is you want to keep the public hearing open, and if so, I think we need an extension. Uh, well, um, uh, why don't you let us respond, and then uh, you can you can let us know your thoughts to see if there's anything outstanding that you want us to address. Um, and and I, I guess I want to, I want to ask the commission to sort of you know step back a little bit and imagine you know there wasn't an application before you. You have this 
really sort of a charming site with an interesting history that has the um, really wonderful opportunity um, for tremendous landscaping enhancements to, to bring you know, that area of the site back to its former glory. And so ask yourselves, what would you do with this property if you could do anything? You would do this. This is what you would do. You'd keep the building. You wouldn't tear it down. You wouldn't build a subdivision. You wouldn't expand. You'd keep the building. You would do stormwater enhancements. You would do landscaping enhancements. You would be respectful to your neighbors. We're doing all of those things. The only way that we can repurpose this building is through a PDD. There is no other zone in your regulations that we can avail ourselves of to maintain this existing building. There is nothing else that we could do on this property that would have less of an impact on any neighbor during construction or post-construction. If Mr. Can is concerned about impacts on wildlife, then he should say, please approve this. Don't tear down any trees so you can build another single family home. We're maintaining all that mature vegetation. There are hundreds of feet between his house and this building. Our lighting complies with all of your lighting requirements. We will put the lighting on a timer if that, if that helps, but we comply with all those requirements. Um, we'd be happy to accept as a condition of approval that we will you know, specify which, which landscaping items um, we can maintain, which are gonna be replaced, but you know, we want this to be a really attractive site. And that's why uh, Todd has proposed such a robust landscaping plan that, that he just showed you. Um, you know, whether there's lighting impacts on wildlife is not within your jurisdiction. You have specific lighting requirements as we discussed with Amazon, you have specific lighting requirements in this, in this context, and we comply. And again, I think that you know what we're proposing is going to have the least amount of impact on wildlife or humans in the area. Um, I know that the other neighbor, Timothy Hunter, had asked about you know what else could we could do this property. Under our proposed PDD regulations, we can't do anything else. Our bulk requirements meet what's what the existing building is. We can't go up. We can't go out. In fact, you know we I think we have. Um, height limitations that are less than a single family home. So again, I, I think that the neighbors should be embracing this use and not critiquing it. Um, in terms of dumpsters, I think Todd can indicate on the plan where the dumpsters are located. Um, I'm, trying to look, I'm just trying to look in the chat to see what else um, there may be. Um, Todd, you know, wh why don't you share your screen and you can sort of walk through the dumpster location. Um, because again, I mean, these are not residents who are going to be throwing stuff into the wetlands or over a fence or into neighbor's yards. Uh, again, Todd Ritchie, for the record. Um, I, I just want to start off with um, just giving some clarification on the lighting. Um, the survey uh, doesn't actually show there's an existing light pole here, but I have a photo that I'll share that shows it. So there's, there's an existing, it shows the other light poles on the site, but for some reason we didn't, our company didn't do this survey, but there's not a light pole sh uh, shown here. Uh, but I can show you a photograph that I took. So this is the this is the edge of that area, um, uh, which is like the park like area. And as if I zoom back, you can see there's a, a three headed um, uh, light pole on the very rear of the of the property. All we're proposing is to is to replace and upgrade that light. Um, it could be put on a timer, certainly. As, as it is it, with, with you know, compliant lighting, all of the lighting on the site is obviously uh, outdated and old and some of it maybe not even functional for the purposes of safety and, and other things. So we're not adding any lighting in areas that aren't already illuminated now. Um, and along those lines, I, I'll, I'll kind of flip down to the uh, photometric plan, uh, the rear of the building, uh, same thing you could see the extent of the lighting. It's within the, the, the asphalt areas, which is necessary for, um, for safety and for um, you know, vehicle maneuvering when they come up to the, the building or any, any other emergency issues that may arise. Uh, the lighting has low lighting that are more like sort of wall-mounted fixtures that are right next to the doors like you would have at you know, going into your house. Um, and then it also has higher up 
projection lights, but all of this would be LED uh, updated and everything is required to be directed downward, uh, dark side compliant, and also you can't see the light source uh, based on that. So, so again, this is, this is all of the lighting is even these locations along here have shifted a bit, but there's already light poles along the driveway and in the parking lot. There's bollards around the building. There's uh, building mounted lights. We're not adding any building mounted lights in locations that aren't already mounted with lights. We're just uh, obviously um, providing new fixtures that are uh, updated compliant. Um, as far as the uh, dumpster, oh, sorry, dumpster locations, still on the wrong page here. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, the dumpster, it would be behind the building, just like they probably were before, but they aren't right now because the building's been vacant for a long time. Um, so they would be in most likely, I don't know where they work historically because I don't have a record of that, but in this area where the, all the bollards are because bollards uh, usually put around dumpsters for um, protect them, protect the equipment, pr protect the building from the activity of the dumpsters being um, maintained. Um, so that those would be close up against the building, not towards the wetlands. And that would be in a location where the, it's next to a loading zone. So, you know, there could be, uh, access to it that's not permanent parking. Um, I'm just trying to think as far as the one more thing regarding the landscaping, there's a question of what's staying or what's going. I mean, I've showed pictures before uh, and we have plenty of them. The, the landscaping is, I could go through them again. Uh, the landscapes, landscaping's overgrown and there's nothing worth saving. Uh, everything is beyond its uh, you know, projected life uh, if anything, there's things that have become hazards to maybe building materials or, or you know, or the building itself, you know, so it's all got to go and come out. And the only way to do that is, you know, to start fresh. And that's what's going to happen. Now, there's no proposed removal of any um, trees such as, um, let me give the, uh, the pat, you know, there's the, the other question was, you know, the vegetation surrounding the, the property. We've shown that before. I mean, it's a very well vegetated perimeter. Of the property, so there's no nothing along the driveway or any mature vegetation around the perimeter of the property that's going to be removed. The only vegetation that's proposed to be removed is anything that's overgrown around the building, as you can see in in these areas like foundation plantings and anything in these like sort of courtyard areas here, and then of course in this area here, and and and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, there was that one bush, if you remember, that was recommended by our, our traffic engineers to be taken out at the end of the driveway. That was something that was specific to sight lines. Um, so I, I, I think that uh, addresses uh, the comments that were brought up uh, in the interim. Okay, thanks, Todd. I don't know that, that there's anything else in Mr. Hunter's comments that are that require any further um, response or frankly merit any further response. Um, you know, you know in, in terms of keeping the hearing open, Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, we're, we're happy to do that. If you think that there's somehow something missing, um, I, I think that our response memo and our revised plans, our revised architecturals and our presentation tonight have, have answered most of the questions. But, you know, I also don't want you know, the staff or, you know, any member of the commission to, if we close the hearing, then, you know, somehow have a question that they don't have an opportunity to have answered or, you know, maybe be, um, you know, have some misinformation or, or think, you know, the, um, it's actually when the truth is it's why. So, you know, we're happy to work with you. As I said, I, I you know, I, I, I'm pretty passionate about this project. I think it's really interesting. Um, I think it's a really wonderful reuse of the site. And I can't imagine any better use of the site, um, but I don't want to, you know, you're always in um, anxious to close the hearing and get to a vote, but I don't want, you know, that to stand in the way of making sure that the commission is as comfortable as it needs to be to, you know, give us the vote that we very much desire. Um, uh, Chuck Candace here. Thank you, Mr. Nuff. What about the open space questions that Harry had alluded to? I think 
uh, th there's the whole Lions Park issue, whether that would be open to the public. And I understand that the, you know, the owner would want some control of that. And also the, the access to the public open space. I think that Harry was suggesting, could we get that more robust? Um, I mean, the, the, that sort of, I mean, this, this is a PDD. Um, I, 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 did you address, I, I, I don't yeah. know what your comments yeah. were. So, so the, um, uh, let's break those two things down. One is the access to the um, open space to the rear. I mean, we're happy to provide that access. And if you want Todd to go through that again, I, we, we think it's more than adequate in terms of its size. Um, yeah, it's a, you know, I, I stood out there and we've had photographs if you want to see those. It, it's, it's a really beautiful piece of property as, as, as Harry has indicated, and we're happy to accommodate that access. Um, and we think that what we're proposing is, is sufficient in terms of uh, the number of people who, who will be making that trip. In terms of Lions Park, you know, as I said, you know, we're not going to be standing out there with an armed guard asking people to leave. But the, you know, you know, we're going to be have we're going to have some residents who are frankly elderly. They're not going to be fifty eight. They could they could be in their seventies, maybe in their early eighties. And could there be a kid, you know, hanging out or a couple of kids drinking beer? Yeah, there, frankly, there could be. But you know, certainly they're not going to be, you know, if a some folks in the neighborhood decide to go for a stroll on a, you know. On a nice summer evening, decide to stop there and take a look at you know Todd's beautiful plantings that he has planned there, whether they're rose bushes or whatever, and literally stop and smell the roses. Of course, they're welcome. You know, I mean, they're going to be you know this project is going to be a good neighbor to to the neighborhood, but they just want to have some ability to uh, to control who are the folks that are that are utilizing that in in a reasonable, friendly, neighborly way. Hey, John, could I just say one thing about that? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing is is the, is providing access to the open space that's main, that's um, that's most safe and maintainable, um, because if we expand any area to the say to the south, that's all wooded areas. That's not going to benefit anybody from an access standpoint. We're we're providing sidewalks and a sidewalk access, and now even a concrete sidewalk and bituminous sidewalk all the way from the the border of the um, open space out to Bourbon Drive and ultimately likely to be connected to uh, the park to the to the I guess it's to the east northeast uh, and continue on and in addition to the uh, Lions Park area so I just don't know that I, in my mind it's just that this is the ideal access um, that it's it's also going to be as um, the neighbor had said, I guess, and the other, you know, here's an open space that currently doesn't have, and it's the worst part about open space sometimes is, is nobody thinks about the access, but it's nice open space and in, in the middle of, surrounded by private properties, you know. Um, so, you know, this will be a maintained private act, uh, a public access, but privately maintained. So the, the, the town doesn't have to worry about that. Um, if you give if you give easements in in wooded areas, then who's gonna if there's a trail or something like that, who's gonna maintain it? Uh, that's not that's not necessarily on the on the uh, on the on the owner to maintain a like a path through the woods. Um, they maintain sidewalks and you know and roads and and that sort of thing. So, well, I I mean my thought is if if it's going to be open to the public, we will need some sort of easement. I mean, maybe it's oh, no, safer. Than and that's what's pre no, and that's what's preferred, prefer preferred, Mr. Chairman, uh, or right. pr proposed. So yes, easement, yes, but more of an land, more of a wider sure. land access doesn't really make a lot of sense when you, when you think about it, because it's all wooded anyway. It would be all wooded anyways if it's okay. wider. So. Okay. Well, oh, turning to Lions Park, then, the, am I correct, then, Mr. Nuff, that you're open to some sort of easement for the public? to the access it subject to your right to kick out bad guys or something like that. In other words, I, I, I think there still would need to be some sort of easement, public access easement, maybe as, as a condition of approval for the Lions Park thing. Well, I, I mean, I mean, um, not where I currently live, but I mean, I, I've often had kids in the neighborhood play in my front yard. It's like, well, yeah, does, so do, do, they have mean, an, do they have an easement? Of course they don't. But, but I'm not kicking them out, and nor is, nor is anyone else. Okay. Yeah, I, well, I, I, guess uh, I, I guess I sort of, you know, I, I mean, we're both lawyers, but I don't know that, that we need to make it 
that legalistic that if you know folks want to come and as I said stop and smell the roses that you know they're going to be precluded from doing so. Um, Harry Smith, can I just interject for a second, Chuck, if you don't mind? Um, yeah. I'll just give a for instance. I mean, there is a seawall adjacent Owen Ego in, and informally for years and years and years, um, residents in the area quietly have been allowed to walk from 146, where it comes out uh, down near the shore, along that seawall, and part of it has an easement along that wall to the Owen Ego. Um, one of the property owners bordering the Owen Ego. Um, within the last year or so, uh, there was a change in who owned the property, a gentleman died, property transferred, now being controlled by another person, as my understanding, decided to put a fence up, perfectly legal, six feet or less fence, blocked the access off completely. They just weren't comfortable any longer with the pro public going through. I don't know if there were issues or concerns. I heard different stories, but I'll just say without a formal easement, you know, you and your client might be perfectly willing to let people come in Lions Park. Some future owner may decide they don't want that to happen. Um, so, I mean, I, I just think I, I very strongly, uh, I frankly, disagree. And I was speaking for 35 years experience working in the public realm as a, as a town planner and community planner. And I've seen a lot of situations where things are intended to go well. Sometimes they do go well for a while. And then it can go a different direction with different ownership. So I think that is entirely a possibility. I also think one of the charms of the area, frankly, as you go down that access road is the um, wooded nature of the wetland area on the adjoining property to the Southeast. And to have sort of a wider protected corridor that property owner would not disturb, maybe it's a conservation easement in that location. Again, this is off your client's project property, so I understand that. Um, you know, this might be another piece that comes in at another point in time in the future. Um, also, since I'm talking here, um, I guess I'm gonna quickly share my screen just to show one little issue here. Um, again, maybe uh, Todd, you can correct me if I don't have this. Well, actually I do right here. So as my cursor is going along, this is the location where the now paved path would intersect the town's open space. Um, and walking out there, I think there's sort of a natural low point right about maybe about here that I sort of walked across and there is a sort of very you know, overgrown informal path that sort of winds its way down. That, wherever that is about in here is probably the more logical location point so that someone is coming onto the open space to the south owned by the town at a place where there is already an existing kind of informal path. So we can work that out. I'm sure that's no, you know, but I just wanted to point that out that probably would need to take this from here probably to somewhere about there uh, to make it connect with that point. Um, and also just want to point out the right in here and I go back to the lighting plan, which I don't think seem to have in this set. Um, there's a spot here, I think the foot candle reading, I think was about 14 um, under that line of lights right adjacent to the building. Um, the regulations limit you to five foot candles in the building perimeter area in this zone, because this is not a high commercial activity zone like Route 1. So I think those would need to be looked at just to make sure they comply with the regulations um, in that area. And I appreciate the comment about the existing landscaping. That was what I thought was the case in this area. Um, and I think everything else I've mentioned. Oh, one other thing is the dumpsters should be in an enclosure uh, that's in the townwide design guidelines. Um, so if you're proposing to put them outside of in, just in some kind of pad without an enclosure around it, that should really be rethought and the enclosure provided. Thank you. Chuck Kanish Chair, thank you, Gary. Um, just so you know where I'm coming from, Mr. Nuff, on, on the on the easement for the Lions Park thing, this this is uh, th this isn't a power grab. It, it's something that has been quasi public, I think, since it since it was a hospice and even the religious use. And I and and I think so. So it, it, no, I, I, I mean the it, idea is to continue that. We'd like to right. continue that, and I don't know how you. I think what Harry said is accurate, and, but I understand you, you want to have the right, if, if there is someone, whatever, you know, beer drinking, whatever, you ought to be able to kick them out. 
I, 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 I mean, yeah. I, so, so let me approach it this way. And, and, and the point is not to be contentious with, with the commission. I, I, th I think we all want what's best for the neighborhood, for the community, for our residents. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think, you know, good results come from, you know, this sort of back and forth and dialogue. Um, you know, you know, one sort of, uh, one thing to get out of the way is that I understand that, you know, Harry said, well, your client could sell this and put a fence around it and, you know, barbed wire and keep everybody out. I mean, I, mean, I, I know that there's no guarantees in life, but, you know, it is my client's intent to, um, I mean, they purchased this property and their intent is to continue to own it. I mean, I mean, that is, that is what his history is as a developer is to develop and hold and not to sell. Um, I guess the other big picture item is that, you know, but for this type of project, Lions Park wouldn't, it, the continuation of Lions Park would be um, very much in peril because again, if there was a, some other development other than a, uh, a repurposing of this building, you'd be using that for parking or for a garage or God knows what. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think my client's making a substantial commitment to Lions Park by, simply by maintaining it. There is no current easement. They could do whatever they want with it, in, including putting a storage shed probably. But we, you know they don't want to do that. They want to really enhance it, beautify it. But they, I think they also, you know, we're all concerned about you know the residents who are going to be living here and 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 what they're going to be told and you know what the size of the units are. I think they want to say to their residents, by the way, this park is yours. This park is yours. Some neighbors may be stopping by, but at the end of the day. This, this park belongs to the residents. And I think it is, it is a real amenity for the residents. It's an amenity for the neighborhood. So for those folks who are traveling down the easement to get to the open space, you know, they can enjoy the, the beauty of it. As I said, I don't think nobody's gonna be kicking them out, but at the end of the day, I think, it, I think it's an important marketing point for, the, um, you know, for my clients to tell, to tell the potential residents, look at this beautiful area that's gonna be yours exclusively. Um, in terms of the, 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 the dumpster enclosure and the lighting, I'm, I'm sure we can take that, you know, we can deal with those as conditions of approval. Hey, hey, John, I just had one more uh, comment uh, based on Harry's uh, comments about the location of the path. Um, I think this might be helpful. Um, you see this? Oh, hold on one second. I think you should be able to see it now. Yeah. Um, so, so the path is, is shown here. I, I did walk along here. I mean, there is so somewhat more established path uh, over in this area here, but people also drive in and park all throughout this area and walk up and, 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 and part of it is to, you know, make sure that there is some separation between folks traversing the site and the people living there uh, so that they could feel like that, you know, they're, they're not having pe people walking across um, the, in front of them all the time. But the other thing too is we need this area for snow storage. You know, there's there's got to be places that we can put snow. And if we're put if somebody comes in to plow and they're pushing snow up in this area, then it's it's going to be piled up on top of the path. So, I mean, I think this is one of the best locations to keep it. At, you know, from getting snow pushed up on because of you know clearing out the parking spaces. And, uh, and so that's, I think I, you can est easily establish it look like another path in this location, a footpath. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that would take quite a bit of work, Harry Smith Town Planner. Uh, maybe if you could certainly push it over towards the property line and, and get it closer, you know, if you wanted to. I'm pretty sure if there wasn't a path there before and we were just creating this access now, then that wouldn't be a problem. Well, it's terrain. So I think, you know, you're talking about people and how easy it is to walk. I mean, there is sort of a, a the rise is higher, I think, in the area where you're bringing the path into the open space, as opposed to the area you're talking about further to the north. Well, I, I, again, I stand, I, I, stand by, I stand by my comment that we need places to put snow that's not going to... I appreciate that comment. But I think that them. both of the things could, you know, co you know, coexist there. You've got at least uh you know 20 feet to maybe less than 10 or maybe about 10 10 to 20 feet of of area there along the that bay of the parking lot butting up against the property line so i think there's probably a lot of area for snow storage and probably you could get that path connection a lot closer to the uh kind of existing path 
so that's my recommendation and I'll just leave it there to the commission. Um, Harry, Harry, I, I, I really think that that's probably something we could work with you on in terms of- I'm sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, Chuck Anders Chair, uh, any- uh, We do have another a resident who I think has, Mr. Can has his hand raised for quite a while at this point if you'd want to recognize him again. It's, sure, to make it quick, we've already done the public, but what, I don't know, maybe new stuff came up. Sure, Mr. Can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I didn't actually hear that you'd closed the um, the public comment, but I had raised my hand right after Mr. Nuff spoke, just because I wanted to have a quick, um, just a quick follow-up comment. I appreciate his fierce defense of his client and the project. Um, I only have myself to speak for my concerns here. So um, having the opportunity to speak and be heard is, is very important to me, and I appreciate that. Uh, I feel that his critique of my concern for the wildlife is unfair, uh, speaking to what other projects may or may not occur on this land. We're looking at the project at hand and it's the only one I can speak to. So certainly uh, my concerns represent specifically what I've seen presented uh, on the plan. Um, <clears throat> he spoke to the location of my house versus the location of their building being several hundred feet. I know that on an overhead map, it looks far and um, the important thing to recognize is that I don't just sit in my house uh, and uh, I'm impacted on all parts of my property. I use all parts of my property. I'm active on all parts of my property. And so recognizing that I can be impacted in other ways than just from my deck or from my house is important for the commission to understand. Um, <clears throat> lighting can be dark sky compliant, but it illuminates by its nature the ground over which it is installed. That's the purpose. And so when I'm looking down at this area, I will see the illumination of all that. Um, now, I know that he has already said that they'll um, work on some timers and motion sensors. I just would like to know, you know, I think it's important part, if it's going to be part of the condition, you know, what are the times specifically that are being discussed here? Uh, you know, when will light, lighting shut off, um, et cetera. So without beating a dead horse here, uh, I did think that it was important to sort of uh, have a little bit of a follow-up on that so that the com commission and yourself can better understand and the, uh, Mr. Nuff and his client can better understand uh, my concerns so that we can move to a um, approval of, of what this commission sees fit. Believe me, I also, um, don't like coming and thinking about this particular project coming up every other Thursday. I'll be happy when we're through the process, but for now, I have to represent my concerns and I appreciate you giving me the time to do so. Uh, Chuck Anderson, thank you, Mr. Can. Okay, we will close the public portion. And just so you know, the rules are the applicants, applicant goes last, applicant gets the last word. Uh, I don't know if we're closing the hearing yet though. So that that's the issue. Harry, do you, what, I just, know you haven't done the full review, but what, I don't. I don't know what you think. No, I just wanted to offer a comment, if I, I may. Um, I don't know whether you consider, but maybe you could consider using bollards in that area um, that sort of has pathways through it that's overgrown beyond the parking lot, closer. That's you know on the side of the property approaching uh, Mr. Khan's property. Um, that might be a solution um, that would allow that area to be lit usable at night and, you know, toned down so it's not impacting or, or uh, you know, creating the, any more of a concern than uh, is commensurate with lighting the area as a minimum. Okay. Todd, uh, does that seem reasonable to you? Uh, it's totally reasonable. Okay. Um, so, so hey, uh, do, do you want to close, Harry? Do you have you done a review? Do you, I I'm comfortable uh, closing the hearing. We can just, we, you know, with the I, I, what, Harry, what what were you going to say? Excuse me. Uh, no, I'm perfectly comfortable with the hearing closing. Just with the, uh, you know, uh, the caveat that I would probably be submitting a more detailed comments if I had any. Um, I'd certainly be willing to work with the applicant and addressing. I mean, I think we're down to a level of detail that can be resolved, as was mentioned, through conditions. I'm um, certainly happy to talk to budding property owners and, and, you know, I don't want to drag this out forever either. Um, so I just wanted to point that out that, you know, I haven't had a chance to go through them in great detail since they came in a little bit late and uh, just put that out there. Thank you. Okay. 
Mr. Nuff, you okay closing then with that understanding or what do you think? What do you uh, want to uh, we're fine closing if the commission, if, if the other commission members don't have any other follow up questions or have any significant concerns, like, you know, um, if, if there's, if there's something that's troubling, you know, you know, some of you or one of you, then, you know, we want the opportunity to, you know, to respond as fully as we can. Uh, but, you know, I haven't heard it, you know, I've seen some members have spoken and if we, if you, if you all feel like we've addressed everything, then, then let, then let's close. Okay, uh, let's open up. Other commission members have any questions, comments, or thoughts about opening or, or closing? Marcy Paluzzi here. I asked the same question both meetings and I haven't gotten an answer to it. If you, I can get the answer, I'd be happy to have it closed. I know I know where I draw the line in the sand on this and, you know, um, and I've been doing some research on unit sizes outside of this but you know well just just to clarify it's an it's an active adult is it all 55 and older yes and 10 percent are affordable yes and what's and the what's the approximate rate of the rentals uh, like, I, don't, I, uh, uh, I don't know that we know exactly what what the 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 rentals will be but i i see i see the affordable units will have to be uh, you know, compliant with 8-30G. In terms of the market rate units, I don't know that that's been determined, um, but I think it's going to be fairly modest, obviously. Right. I was doing a search in New Haven of uh, rentals, and the smallest size rental unit I could find was uh, 450 square feet. Right. And the and average one bedroom was 500 to 600. I, I know there was a mix that there were some bigger that you spoke of in one of the meetings, but I haven't been able to see it and it would be very helpful to me if, you know, I'll look at the large size plans because it's very hard to see on the small size plans. But the last plan I had said it was 58 efficiency units. Is it still 58? Oh, no, no, no. It, um, oh, um, no. There was another set of plans that yes. came in and I believe was passed out. Um, I don't I don't have I have three copies of the site plan from three different dates. I don't have three copies of the architect. Yeah. And I I'll don't, double check. I don't if we got the hard copies we sent in the commission, if we did not get them from the applicant, we did not send them out. So I don't know if we received the hard copies of the second set of architecturals. I believe there are only two sets of architecturals. And I believe uh, we widened, uh, narrowed the corridor to provide some additional space and to allow a shift in the mix to a mix right. of one bedrooms and efficiencies. Right. So, so, so we started off as 58 efficiencies, one one bedroom. They're now split between one bedrooms and efficiencies, and they all got significantly larger because the hallways were, you know, uh, ridiculously oversized. They were eight feet right. wide. So um, John Crude was able to take that space uh, that was uh, from the hallway and repurpose it into the units themselves. And I believe there's only been two sets of architecturals, but um, I just want to make, make, make very much certain that Commissioner Pelosi has the opportunity to get have her uh, question answered in terms of the unit sizes in the mix. I, I do I do believe that they're on the, the hard copies of the plans that have been submitted. And if, if it would be helpful to you, Harry, we'd be happy to supply an additional full size set or sets for any commission members. Because yes, I agree on, on these plans. They're, they're, they're sort of hard to, to read in the smaller scale, particularly the architecturals. If you want more full size plans, we'd be happy to provide those. And I think also if you could, would like to see the common spaces color coded for gathering versus, um, you know, egress and so forth. You know, where the where the common spaces. So the count, the common spaces in the hallways. I'm just having a hard time telling where those common spaces are on the plans. All right. So 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 um, those are indicated. So I, I have a proposal. Yeah, I just don't know how big they are from square foot. No, no, no. I, no, understood. And and color coding would probably be helpful. And I don't I don't want to prolong this for the commission or for all the other applicants who are waiting patiently or maybe waiting impatiently for us. Um, if, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, if if we are simply responding to these questions. And, and frankly, which is, I think, information that's already in the record, but just providing it in a manner that's, that's easier to digest, why don't we keep it open for that purpose with the understanding that, you know, the public comment section is indeed over, unless, uh, unless we come up with something that is, that is something that we haven't already presented. 
Um, Chuck and Sherry, if we're going to keep it open, we got to allow the public comment. So I, even on, I, even on something that that that's not new. Yeah, I I, I don't want to keep because I I don't know if you're just submitting additional plans you've already submitted. That's you don't need to keep the public hearing open. I mean, we, we'll just close okay. It. All right, then 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 let's close and and we'll we'll make sure that you have copies of those plans. And Harry, if you know if it's necessary, maybe you can help, you know, Commissioner Pelosi, you know, you know, you know, look at the plans and, you know, whether color coding, I, I don't think that would be outside the bounds of something we can provide, you know, if it's, if it's simply coloring an area that was simply black and white on the plans that we've already submitted, I think to be, we'd be okay with doing that. It's more understanding the square footage of the library and the, you know, the library okay. and the con spaces. And, 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 and do you think you're going to have follow-up questions with regard to the utilization of that space? No, I just need to see the breakdown so I can understand the density and get okay. my, you know, I fully understand the science question. So that's okay, fine. got it. No, no, no. Uh -huh. I, and, and I understand you have a prof professional expertise. We just want to make sure you have the tools that you need. Yeah, I mean, for the record, I'd just like to disclose, uh, Mars, maybe you should disclose that you're a licensed realtor. Um, so just for I'm the a, record. Yeah, I'm a licensed realtor and I'm a licensed landscape architect and I right. draw up quite a few residential um residential drawings as well Projects. as apartments yep. so i'm very yeah. very sensitive to the size of the units okay. I, also i just want to point out if you're gathering um research or information uh that you want to bring into the deliberation um that would need to be in the public records the applicant have a chance to respond to it before the hearing closes so I don't think, and I'll defer to the chair, but I don't think um, that's something you could probably allow in after the close of the public hearing. Um, I think, I, think I, I would be happy to just give some basic information as a point of reference, because I think it's very hard for people to understand what 10 feet wide feels like. You know, I like I said, I, I'm sitting in a room that's 10 feet wide. Yeah, I, I tried to furnish it with a pull-out couch, and it was difficult to find a couch that I could have a pull-out couch in it. So, you know, I'm just trying to lend perspective like that. And when 20 no. of the units are that narrow, that's my concern. No, I understand, but uh, I am just sensitive to that new information coming in. Yep. After the close of the hearing. Okay. And does anyone else have any questions or additional things they would want to guess or have any thoughts about close, uh, keeping the public hearing open or closed? If not, I think we're going to close it because. Okay. Uh, okay, so I, I don't hear anyone, so we'll close this matter then as a public hearing, and uh, so that's uh, good. We, we will not be discussing this this evening. So understood. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Okay, okay thank you. So I have uh, nine fifty five. We still have uh, other things on the agenda. We have uh, two more public hearings. Let's take a short break and come back at ten o five. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Okay, uh, I see Joe Chadwick. Joe, you're here. I think you're muted, but I see you. Okay, and uh, Joe Bayuso, I see your, I see your phone symbol here. So I think I see Mar Joe. Marcy, Marcy's here, and Massimo. I see, I don't see Massimo. We're unmuted. Yep. Joe by yourself here. Okay. Joe. Joe. And uh, Sharon, uh, Sharon, you're back. You're back. Yep. Sharon Hutner's here. I think we just need uh, Mosmo and Terry. And Terry. Mosmo, you're here. You're here. And Harry, you're here, right? Yes, I am here. I don't see Mazmo at the moment. I, do, I see him. Oh, there he is. Okay. He's not. Um, he should be able to unmute, but um, I'm going to make him a co-host. Maybe he came back on. Okay, he, got it. Yeah, so should, gotcha. Should, I'm here. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, let's uh, call the meeting back to order and continue with our public hearings. Uh, we're on items number five and six of our agenda. That's uh, David uh, So. Silbaclite, uh, Tin Can LLC, 59 North Harbor Street, special exception for motor, motor vehicle service and motor vehicle sales, two special exception applications. Is the applicant here on that one? I am, good evening. You can proceed. Uh, I thought it was pretty well spelled out by Evan in the, in the review, but we're just simply looking for a change in the usage. Okay. Uh, do, do you want to have Evan go through the report? That would be great for me, Evan, if you're available for that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, David is here today seeking two special exception change of use approvals uh, to allow motor vehicle sales and motor vehicle service uh, at his uh, existing uh, business at 59 North Harbor Street. Uh, before us right now is the proposed site plan uh, that he submitted as part of this application. Uh, I believe they currently have a bulk storage approval um, and they are now coming back for this uh, change of use. 
Um, David has described the business as a very niche uh, motor vehicle service and sales. Uh, it deals exclusively in, you know, David, please jump in whenever you feel like you'd like to correct me. Uh, the two seat uh, 1960s English uh, coupes. Uh, I believe the brands are MG amongst others, um, but uh, the existing structure um, uh, has the parking requirements met with inside of it. Uh, they meet the bulk requirements of the IG2 district and they do not propose any exterior changes. Uh, no lighting plan or landscaping plan was submitted as part of this plan. However, they are not making any exterior changes. Uh, they meet the parking requirements. However, I would like to note that these three spaces at the bottom right hand corner uh, appear to be on a different lot. Uh, even with those spaces removed, David still meets the parking requirements. Um, and he has stated that uh, he wants to keep the cars within the structure for their own protection. Um, and it wouldn't be your typical mechanic shop with the number of cars parked all over the properties. Um, and that all of these cars are sent to him from out of state or from across the country uh, to be repaired or sold uh, online. Uh, no earth disturbance is proposed with this special exception. Uh, and based on the application materials, it appears that the criteria are generally satisfied. The applicant uh, appeared before the town center board on March 9th and was issued a positive recommendation. Uh, staff recommends the following conditions. Uh, prior to the start of construction, any necessary erosion control measures shall be installed to the satisfaction of the Z, uh, ZEO if it is deemed necessary. No additional signage or replacement lighting shall be installed without approval from this commission or its designee. And all conditions of the pre previous approval shall remain in full force and effect. Was one of the conditions of the previous approvals no outdoor, no outdoor storage? I do not know. I can check right now. Okay. I'm just wondering, you said none was proposed and maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I'm actually looking that up too <laughs> at the moment. Um, well, we, it, it, would the applicant have any opposition to including that as a condition? No out, outdoor storage of, of vehicles? Or? I, I would have an objection to that only from the standpoint of some one car that sits outside for a week or something to that effect. We're not just for the benefit of everyone who's unfamiliar with our work, we, we are in the business of restoring antique cars that are very valuable and not weatherproof. They're all convertibles. None of our vehicles are hard topped. And therefore, it makes no sense to us to ever put anything outside. So by and large, everything is inside our structure. That's why we built the addition that's in the back about five years ago. Um, and it's all enclosed and everything since we've started this has been enclosed. And in fact, if you were to look at an aerial view of the property in the last year, you would see everything's been enclosed, but I don't want to be limited to, to that. And I'm not looking to have a parking lot out front or out back or anywhere else. I just, I don't want to be prohibited from putting something outside. Uh, Chuck, uh, here's a approval from 2015. Uh, and the only condition is any change to the building structure must be reviewed by staff and may require site plan approval. And then here is a later 2017 approval uh, with the exact same conditions uh, that I've proposed for tonight. Okay. Uh, if there was to be any outdoor storage, and I know you're not planning on it, where would it be? It would only be in the back would be the only opportunity and it's it's actually quite well concealed even if there was something back there and, and moreover quite honestly the value of these vehicles is it makes no sense for me to store them outside these are priceless and i can't risk vandalism uh and, and, nor can i risk water damage but unfortunately that it, it may again it's at such a limited level i i, I honestly sort of see it as a moot point um, no i i, I kind of get it too but you know there's all this possibility you could sell this and someone else could come in and just do whatever they want and then that's I don't know. I, I, in, in all due respect i i i need to just be clear about one thing that's critical about that point 
this is a very unique facility that really would only function for the tiny vehicles that we work with. Our primary subject matter is an 11 foot vehicle that's four foot wide. It's more the size of a golf cart than a car and no automotive uh, restorer, vendor, reseller could live in this property. If, if something happens sure. to me, heaven forbid, and, and this property goes on the market, it's much more likely that it'll be turned into a, a brewery or a, a restaurant. It, it's a, a high level restoration that we did on this Quonset hut. It's a beautiful interior space and it, it works beautifully for our needs, which are to be a national headquarters for a piece of nostalgia that matters to this kind of car collector. But you couldn't put trucks in here. The access of our driveway is very restrictive. If you look in the, in the sort of the lower train track side we have a narrow driveway that's only about 12 feet wide and it's it's extremely difficult to get something down our driveway that's larger than our subject vehicle it, it's a really unique situation and moreover i want to just add that unfortunately for us the motor vehicle laws are all written for a dealership or a national or i mean a, a meineke muffler or a Joe's Repair Shop, and we're none of those things. This is an internet-based business, very infrequent, uh, low volume turnover. We might have a car for six months before we'd be ready to sell it. And I just think that the impact or the, the footprint on the town, it, it's not gonna change from what we've been doing all along. And, I, and I, I, you know, I don't think it's really needs to be too much of a concern. Sure, how about then any outdoor storage shall be limited to the rear of the property? Yeah, that's perfect. I'd okay, be happy. Well, why don't we just throw that in? So that, you know, in a, that'll you know keep your emergency week or so. You know, uh, uh, other than I mean, if it's something over one night, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a way to word this, but it's it is conceivable that something would sit outside until someone came and picked it up. Yeah, no, I understand. I don't think staff will consider that storage if it's just overnight, one night. Right. Okay. And we talk about an ongoing basis, um, so. Uh, and moreover, we, you know, we've done everything we can to beautify this property and, and for us to make yeah. it look like a junkyard would be at cross purposes of what we invested in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's, uh, any questions, comments from commission members? Not then, let's open up to the public, see if there's any public comments. Anybody uh, would like to participate, please use the raise your hand function down at the bottom of your screen, the smiley face reactions, uh, and the bottom option is to raise your hand. I did not see anyone at this time. Okay. So uh, anything else that the applicant would like to add? No, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, great. I think we can close this matter as a public hearing and maybe we can take this up in a little bit. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And then that brings us into item number seven, which is RHC Associates uh, applicant and owner. This is the McDonald's uh, public hearing that we opened last time, the special exception for 424, 436 West Main Street. Uh, is the applicant uh, here on that one? Uh, yes, they are. Harry, could you make Chaz Evans? Uh... A co-host? Certainly. Is there anyone else that should become a co-host? Chaz, you should be able to unmute yourself and share your screen as needed. Just, just me tonight for the, uh, the applicant. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commission. Evan, I don't know if you want to present. We did receive um, a revised staff report. Um, on the items per the comments from last hearing. Um, really, there's only one comment, Evan. I don't know if you want to go over that or if you want me to just kind of walk through ours. We did pre prepare a couple more uh, exhibits to present tonight. Uh, yeah, you can go first if you'd like. Sure. Um, so the main uh, item, as you're probably aware from last hearing, was the, um, the vehicle queuing um, and what's in the code and, and how it applies. Um, in our review of the code and, and how the situation is now and what we're proposing. Um, unfortunately, in the code, there's no definition of whether queuing occurs at order stations or if queuing occurs at where you end up picking up your food in this case. Um, 
we feel that obviously the queuing provided comes through an entire, the entire loop and all guests served. Uh, if I can share my screen here. You know, and you guys can see um, the existing conditions there. Yep. Um, so again, th this property is a little different than a, than a standard fast food in a sense. It's not as rectangular. It's a little bit more of a square building. Um, so it doesn't lend for as long of queue lengths. Um, that being said, we did look at, at stacking and you've probably seen a, a this either this exhibit or a similar one uh, last hearing showing existing, there's 12 stacking spaces. Uh, we'll be proposing 16 and that's from where the, uh, the pickup window is for the food. Uh, we look at it uh, from McDonald's, all the ones we do, uh, not only throughout the state of Connecticut, but up and down the East Coast. Um, and really the, the driving factor and the slow point in this operation is providing the food, not placing your order. Um, so the improvements of only having six stacking stations between the pickup window and the order point to now having 10 between the pickup window and the order point is really what's making this um, use a lot more efficient um, in our understanding. Um, and I know the discussion had been previously in prior hearings about how it affects the intersection being so close to the intersection. Um, so one exhibit we did prepare um, for tonight is looking at what um, 16 cars looks like if you have 16 guests being served by the drive through at one time. My gut tells me this is what the commission's seen. This is what the commission's heard about at this McDonald's, um, you know, during peak hours is that it does have impacts to the intersection. Um, would that be the case? Uh, um, I anecdotally, I, I, I've heard that it does extend out sometimes. Yep. Okay. So this, this is again, what we looked at with, this is how 16 cars currently fit on the site. If everyone's utilizing the drive through um, again, we go back to the side-by-sides and really their goal um, for all McDonald's is to reduce that pinch point between um, not only the, the pickup window, but, but the order points and have, you know, if someone's indecisive of what they want to order, it allows that flexibility. Um, and this provides, again, the, the, our proposal is to provide 16 queuing spaces um, from that window the entire way back through. And that's before a pedestrian um, cross or after a pedestrian crossing. Um, so again, we're asking the, the commission for approval of the spe special exception. Uh, I know in the, uh, in the staff report, there were three conditions, which all are, are will complies and, and didn't have any concerns on our end. Um, other than that, uh, I'd open up to any questions for the commissioner, Evan, if you had anything else. Uh, I can go through my staff report now if, if you'd like. Um, Thanks, Evan. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, I'd like to share my screen, uh, Jazz, if that's... Thank you. Yep. Uh, all right, so here is the uh, site plan that would, has been submitted. Uh, we saw this at the last meeting as well. Um, I'm going to jump forward to the drive-through window, uh, section 715 of our code. Uh, the minimum queuing spaces requirement, uh, it is six, six spaces for the first window or station and two additional spaces for each additional window or station. Uh, the proposed changes would include two windows and two digital menu board or ordering display stations. Uh, therefore, 12 spaces would be required uh, for this setup. Uh, the commission would need to determine if the required queuing spaces must be calculated uh, from this initial order point uh, or further along in the drive-through service process. Um, <clears throat> based on the practices of other Connecticut municipalities and other publications from the American Planning Association, staff feels that the queuing spaces should be cal calculated uh, from this initial ordering point. Um, in the applicant's uh, response to this staff report, uh, they stated in the existing condition, approximately six, uh, 
approximately six cars can be in the queue prior to the menu board and the proposed condition the approx in the in, in the proposed condition approximately six cars can be in the queue prior to the menu boards uh, therefore the applicant is proposing six spaces uh, where the re regulations would require 12. Uh, I think the applicant is essentially arguing that this is a non-conforming condition. I would I would like Chaz to uh, confirm that uh, if if he could. Um, uh, in, in our eyes, we would consider this actually a conforming condition because we there is no set definition, unfortunately, that it's the order point or the pickup window. Um, in McDonald's experience, again, the pinch point is the pickup window, and that's that's where um, the inefficiencies come in. Um, so unfortunately lacking a definition we would consider, and that's the, the stacking analysis we had done, the existing use, the existing condition would require 10 stacking um, where 12 is provided. The proposed adding an extra order point would require 12 stacking uh, where 16 is provided. Sure. Um, well, it is a determination that the commission is, has, is going to have to make. Um, and like I stated, uh, I wasn't able to find any other examples of municipality uh, zoning regulations or any publications from the American Planning Association uh, or any other publications that pointed to uh, the queuing spaces being calculated from anywhere other than the initial ordering point. Um, another determination that the commission is, asked, is going to have to make uh, is whether or not, um, if this is to be considered a nonconformity, if that is allowed to continue. Um, section 96B states that all site plan revisions must bring into conformance to the extent practicable, all aspects of the site that do not conform to the current regulations. Uh, so those are the two determinations that the commission would have to make uh, prior to determining uh, anything tonight. Um, there is also uh, section 17B, an exit or entrance for such lane shall be as far as possible from uh, a street or intersection. Um, the commission will need to determine if this nonconformity is allowed to continue uh, as the entrance to the uh, queuing lanes uh, is about 40, 45 feet, maybe a little bit more uh, from the entrance to the, uh, to the site. Um, finally, onto the special exception criteria. Uh, based on the applic application materials, it appears that the special exception criteria are generally satisfied with the exceptions of items seven and eight. Uh, I will read those for you now. The design, location, and specific details of the proposed use or activity must not adversely affect safety in the streets, nor unreasonably increase traffic congestion in the area, nor interfere with the pattern or vehicular traffic in such a manner as to create or worsen unsafe traffic conditions. Uh, staff is still concerned that this um, that this non-conforming queuing or stacking spaces are too close to the entrance and could adversely affect safety in the adjacent street and interfere with the pattern or vehicular circulation, which would lead to unsafe traffic condition. Uh, I have uh, put together and circulated to the commission uh, just a collection of other sites in the area around the city of New Haven. Um, right, right before us now is the actual Brantford location and I just took these screenshots and used the measuring tool on Google Maps. Uh, it came up with about a 45, 50 foot measurement from where the proposed queuing spaces would begin to the entrance. It's about 45, 50 feet, like I just stated. Um, every other example from around New Haven or in the general New Haven area was at least double this distance. Uh, as well as all of the initial ordering points were in the rear of the principal structure. Um, so I'll just scroll through these very quickly. If, if you'd like, Evan, I could, I could speak to some of those. Actually, all, all of those, I believe, are the side-by-side -side drive throughs um, Oh, that's correct. And if you do look at between the side-by-side drive through where that's located and where your pickup window is, there's about a seven to eight, sometimes 10 car stacking between that. So it's kind of a, a McDonald's standard in terms of how far they place the side-by-sides to provide, again, the queuing from where you pick up the food to when you place the order. Um, another item to note, and Evan, I know you and I talked to it, um, just wanted to make the commission aware. 
a lot of the documentation when it comes to stacking um, in any of the publications don't necessarily get into side by side. Uh, McDonald's has been doing this for about a decade with these new side by sides, but as the industry trends catch up, the legislation and, and the regulations mm -hmm. catch up to okay, what's what's adequate for a side by side drive through. Um, so again, the, a lot of the stat the the data on stacking comes to your single order point, um, where again, you know, it could be a, a family of five coming from soccer practice that's making a big order that's holding up someone behind them that just wants a simple order of fries. Um, the side by side drive throughs help with those efficiencies where they can take multiple orders and adjust the flow of traffic within the site instead of people getting backed up on the road and deciding they'd rather just go into the store. Thank you, Jess. Um, so just quickly again, like, like the applicant just stated, these are all side-by-side -side configurations. Uh, however, the distance from the queuing spaces to the entrances are at least double, if not triple, in all these examples. Um, I wasn't able to find any anything in the general area that had a distance similar to what the applicant is proposing uh, now. Um, and <clears throat> Chaz get, uh, sent this over this afternoon, um, and I believe you know the the proposed queuing would start right around the the front of the principal structure. So just based on this, you know, if we were if we were to say that three car lengths from those six proposed in the stacking spaces here, you know, if it if we were to calculate the the queuing requirements uh, based on our zoning regulations for twelve. Um, that number would put these cars just about against the sidewalk or, or up against the, the entrance to the, the site. Um, and just getting back to the item eight from the special exception criteria, uh, it states parking areas must be of adequate size for the particular use and be suitably, suitably screened from adjoining residential uses and entrance and exit drives must be laid out so as to prevent traffic hazards and nuis nuisances. Uh, staff is still concerned that the entrance drive and the proximity of the non-conforming queuing spaces to it could create traffic hazards and nuisances. Uh, I have prepared some uh, conditions uh, should the commission decide to approve the special exception application. Uh, these conditions include uh, erosion control measures installed to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer, uh, no additional lighting, uh, installed without the Planning and Zoning Commission approval, and uh, all landscaping must be maintained as an ongoing re requirement of this application. Uh, Chuck Anders, Chair. Thank you, Evan. Uh, let's open up for questions from Commission members. Commission members have any questions? I, I, I guess the obvious reason you can't put them in the back is because you don't have the space. You have a weird configuration of the property. Is that correct? Correct. It, it is a unique position. And Evan, I don't know if you can share your screen. Um, there is a pinch point on the residential property where the where the property you see juts in. Um, again, if if the, if there was you know, if if they had that property, they would you know. It would be a different discussion and be eight cars. It, it'd be simple. It, it's we're working with, with what we have. And again, the pinch point really isn't the orders as much as it is making sure there's enough stacking after everyone places their order. There's so much. There's only so much food you can send out the window at, at a certain given time. Um, nowadays, again, you can take online orders. You can have the people ordering here. They have you know if if you've been to the McDonald's recently, you have the the online pickups. Um, when the drive through happens to get backed up, they send people to the parking spaces right next to it as well um, for larger orders that take a little bit more time to, to pick up. So those, those two spaces are signified on this plan right after the drive through but realistically, they could expand that to four 
if needed in a in a peak time frame if they're running. <laughs> um so again yeah we are we are hamstrung to that site corner um to shifting it any further away from the intersection i can't just share thank you um questions from any commission members have any questions or comments Why don't we, uh, Fred, you're here. <laughs> um, why don't we open it up to the public then, see if any uh, members of the public wish to comment? Uh, sure, any member of the public that would like to participate, uh, please use the raise your hand function through the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, looks like we have one member of the public that would like to speak. Uh, Can I interject Ralph? one second first? Uh, Fred, were you here for the entire public hearing of this? Wait a minute, let me make you a co-host. Hang on a second. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Great. Yeah. You hear me? Yes. Uh, I listened to the... Uh, oh, you're frozen out. My phone. The, the proceeds of this meeting... Say okay, so you've been here for the entire public hearing of this? I, I, was, I was not on the Zoom... I was on my cell phone. I was at an event that I had to be at. But I had right, my right, cell right. phone and I watched the. Okay. Okay. Good. I just wanted to note that for the record. Thanks. Sorry. 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 Interrupt. Right. Okay. No problem. So we had a member of the public wish to comment. Uh, yes, Mr. Pavone. Yes, hi. I'm Ralph Pavone. My address is 10 Gentile Place, Brantford. I'm the house right behind McDonald's. Uh, I have a couple concerns about this drive through one, what is McDonald's going to do to protect my property? Okay. Because we let this past summer, we already had one of their patrons come over their wall and hit my house and almost hit my wife. She was on the deck Two, We have, our bedroom is on that side of the property. So with this additional lane, we're going to get more, uh, headlights coming through the bushes that they provide into my bedroom window. As it stands now, when they are open 24 hours, we have to deal with their parking light in the back, which lights up our whole backyard and into our house. So I'd like to know what they, what they propose to do to correct these problems for us. Chuck Anderson, thank you, Mr. Pavone. Chuck, I, I can take that one. We, we are proposing a, a fence along that property line uh, currently where the, uh, the outside fence is not, the fence is not going to hold a car coming through. You're going to need to put some kind of barrier to hold the car from coming through. You got one lane that the car, one car came through. Now you add another additional lane. We could have two cars coming through into we're, our property. We're actually remo we're removing one circulation lane to, to have only one. There, there's there right now. There's currently one drive through lane, one circulation lane, a row of parking, and another circulation lane. We're removing the redundant circulation is just so you have one drive through and one one way circulation around the site. Um, again, we're there's there's it's a tight area. We are providing a fence. Um, we could look at providing a separate means if, if that's what the commission would like us to provide. Um, and now you're still going to be a, a, a 24 hour on, on some sites that you're here. Correct. They, they don't. They don't plan to change the operation. It's just. It's just adjusting the drive-through to improve. Okay. So if you put a fence, are you going to put some kind of barrier over to to prevent the lighting to come through into my bedroom window, with with the additional traffic coming through? There's there's no additional traffic proposed. The the traffic that's on the road now is the same traffic that's. No, you got two lanes, Greg. You got you're gonna you got you just showed on the print. You got two lanes of two cars coming through. 16 at a time you got so you could have 16 cars coming through you're telling us you got 16 cars coming through your drive-through according to your according to your print i just saw two lanes of cars one on the original one and one on the outer side so now if you got if the lane if the if the lane is stopped because they're getting their order i got two cars pointing their headlights right at my house potentially four cars 
So so, I mean, I, I would. I mean, I, I dealt with the, I, I dealt with this for so many years with the one, and we lived with it. But I, I, I can't see doing dealing with it, have to deal with it uh, with another lane of cars, and then plus it, it, it's bad enough when uh, McDonald's gets their delivery, they get it at the middle of the night, and we hear it. It's bad enough when you guys have some maintenance in the middle of the night. I have to hear it. Um, so, you know, like in the summertime, you guys power wash at 12 o'clock at night to two o'clock in the morning. Uh, we have to hear it. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's, you know, I think there's enough is enough. Understood. And, and this application is not proposing any any difference in, in number of vehicles or any difference that there's, we, as we showed in the existing one, there can be 16, there, if there's 16 cars serviced there now, they go out in the intersection. What it's doing is is improving the existing situation um, and improving the efficiencies in in the driveway to get cars through quicker, so they're not sitting. Um, yeah, so you're right. According to according to the print, there was two lanes. You have one lane here, one lane here. Unless I, I know. Correct, I know. and there's there's current there is currently three lanes. There's yeah. currently the drive through and two two bypass. Yeah, right. So I mean, there could be cars sitting there waiting to get out, right? At some point, I'm going to have a, you're going to have additional cars coming through your drive-through, pointing their headlights in the middle of, in the middle of the night at my house. At some point, we wouldn't anticipate any more cars than exist today, because there's no there's no additional traffic being created from the road that turns onto the site. The traffic that's there now is the same traffic afterwards. Commission, can you bring? Uh, Pull up the print of the uh, 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 the plot plan for me, please. Sure, Maybe I'm right. looking at it wrong. No, okay, no, no. yeah, that, that one. Okay, so I'm looking at it right now. You have the original drive-through that comes around, and then you have an additional drive-through which you already that 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 you're taking away from the existing parking spaces that are there. So at some point you got two point you got two spaces where you could place an order, am I right? You got one here, Correct. you got yes. one there, and one there. Okay, so at some, at one point you got two car. If if if, if the drive through is busy, you have two cars waiting at this point to place their order. Now you look straight ahead where that open area is on the other side of the fence. That's my house. Understood. That that's where we're proposing the the sealed fence. But fence but also a fence is is fine but it's also need to be be that no light can penetrate it has to be like a a, a, a plastic fence or a, a, a steel uh page fence with slats in it to cover the lights because i'm still going to get light in my bedroom i get it right now i'm looking right out my window i got a car coming right through to your drive through right now uh mr pavone uh just for the record um section 17 d does require uh, a solid wood fence, synthetic wood-like fence, or a masonry wall at least six feet in height uh, for uh, this particular okay, year. Okay, I would take the masonry wall, so at least that, because I'm going to tell you right now, I, I could show, I could send, I could send the commission the pictures of the damage of my house that their his patrons did to my house. I'm still in the process of trying to get that taken care of through their insurance company. So I'll, maybe a block wall would be a little more preventive. Than, uh, uh, than a fence. Does six feet tall block the light? Yes, because what happens is their their property is higher. Mm -hmm. Okay, than ours. So there's like a there's like a there's like a there's like a four foot almost like a three and a half foot dip between the top of their top of their property to our, to the pro, to our property. So if you figure you put another six feet, it's ten about ten feet high. So, you know, I, I, I'm not unreasonable. As long as it blocks the light from coming into my bedroom at night. And it protects the property. And, and protects my property. I, I have no problem with that. Okay. So, I mean, uh, you know. The option is that we sell it to you. So, I mean, unless they, like I told you, unless they want to they buy it, it's open. They could buy it. <laughs> I got no problem with that either. <laughs> that'll solve their problem <laughs> so but anyways that, that's my main concern about it is you know if it happened one actually this be honest with you this is the second time somebody's come through mcdonald's into our property 
it happened years ago and it just recently happened last spring. Okay. Somebody, you know, it was an accident and, you know, accidents do happen, but, you know, at, the, at this point we, you know, we're taking the blunt of it. So if they can put a six foot uh, concrete block wall up there. Okay. I, I, I'm reasonable. Okay. Chuck Anders here. Thank you, Mr. Bavon. All right. Thank you. Evan, are there other members of the public who want to comment? I don't see anyone else at this time. Any uh, questions, comments from commission members? I, uh, I'm, I'm unclear as to what's safer. I, I'm, uh, I understand that's, that's a separate issue of having a, you know, a safety issue so that both the light and the vehicles don't go into the neighboring property. I understand that, but, but also the, the question of, of the, the stacking I mean, getting it, you know, having a double and having it closer to the street, it does, I mean, all the other ones seem to be behind the property. I, 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 I don't know which one is safer or better. So I'm, I'm, I'm up in the air about it. And I've heard what the staff comments are too, that most of them are out there. So that's where I'm at. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Um, if not, then we can close the public hearing and just talk about it. I don't know if we'll do it tonight, but because it's 1040, it's quarter to 11. I don't, I don't think we will, but, but I don't see the need to keep the public hearing open. Anyone else? Mr. Chair, if there's one, one other thing I could just add to, to that, just for consideration of, again, the, the changes to improve a condition that, that currently we've heard uh, may have issues. Um, the other benefit to this piece, um, if, if Evan, if you pull back up the plan, um, per the, uh, the queuing code is to um, improve the separation of circulation lanes and improve the pedestrian. Um, currently, it's kind of, um, again, as the neighbor had mentioned, it, there's, there's a lane, there's parking, there's another lane, there's drive through. It's kind of, you can have cars going everywhere. Um, the curbing uh, and the islands that are proposed there um, also allow for pedestrians to cross at one, you know, point. Um, so it's, it's overall, not only just from a traffic standpoint, again, getting 16 cars from being in the intersection to 16 cars within the limits of the site. It also allows your pedestrian circulation um, as you're, as you're going off to walk into the site to be more, um, you know, in line with one point instead of having pedestrians cross anywhere. So again, from a safety standpoint, um, this isn't just, you know, improving efficiencies of the drive through It's a safety overall on the site. Um, regarding the, the fencing, I, I don't know if it's, and I can look at spacing, I can look at sizing. Uh, I don't know if, and I don't know if there's utilities behind that wall. I don't know if bollards may help at all along that, uh, that fencing. I know we have bollards when we have other commercial uses that bollards are right up against the front of a, uh, you know, retail building. I don't know if bollards along that frontage would, would help the, uh, the neighbor's case as well. Chuck uh, Andrews here. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Anything else from anyone? If not, then we can close this matter as a public hearing. Again, I don't think we're going to act on this this evening because it's quarter of 11, uh, but it's, uh, something for us to uh, think about. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so um, that brings us then to our minutes. Um, we have uh, two sets of minutes that were mailed out. The uh, our minutes from our February third and also our March third meeting. February the February third one we, we had uh, deferred and uh, I think they had to be corrected and. Am I correct, Harry, that those were you reviewed and you're, you're made any corrections for those? Um, I did not make the corrections personally, but I think uh, Ms. Martin did make the corrections that were noted um, during the prior discussion about the minutes. Okay. Someone want to make a motion with respect to the February 3rd, 22 meetings, if you're okay with those, motion to approve? Chadwick makes that motion. So Chadwick makes a motion to approve. Is there a second? Bruce, a second. 
Okay, and the record reflects Fred has, has joined us and Fred makes the second to approve the February 22 minutes. Uh, any further discussion, all in favor? Joe Chadwick, you in favor? Chadwick in favor. Joe Vaiuso. Is Joe here? Uh, he's muted right now, but. You are unmuted. Joe Vaiuso approves. Okay. I just got on okay. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. Fred? Fred? You approve? Approve. Approve. Marcy? Marcy. Marcy approves. Marcy approves. And chair also approves. So those minutes are adopted. So I want to make a motion with respect to the March 3rd, 22 uh, minutes. And there were also, I want to make a motion with respect to that one. Marcy makes a motion. Okay, Marcy makes a motion. And who wanted to make that second? Joe Vayuso seconds. Of Joe seconds. Any further discussion? All in favor? Joe Chadwick? Chadwick in favor. Fred Russo? Fred Russo in favor. Joe Vayuso? Joe Vayuso in favor. Marcy? Marcy's in favor. And chair's also in favor. Correspondence. We got anything here? Anything here? We have another correspondence. There's only it's cell tower 10 sylvia street it's basically additional equipment being proposed for the tower okay great uh that brings us into old business items number one and two are the buckley road application you heard once before it's been resubmitted and that's on for a public hearing for our next meeting on april 7th item number three is a uh, special exception for indoor regulation i guess also a public hearing set for the our next meeting. Items number four uh, is the uh, Fimble, uh, what is this, a two lot subdivision that um, recently came in and uh, that doesn't need a public hearing, but we, we're not ready to go forward. Is that correct? Right. We'll probably have a staff report for the next meeting is our goal. Okay. So probably looking at next meeting for that one. I have number five, uh, 36 Greenfield Avenue, a special exception for an attached two car garage. And that's scheduled for a public hearing at our next meeting on April 7th. I have number six, uh, this is uh, Claude V. Seapot, uh, 33 Island View Avenue, coastal site plan, single family home. Understand, are we ready to go forward with that one? Uh, yes, uh, we are. I believe. Yeah, could, could you I'm make ready. Uh, oh, Okay. Yeah, so he's ready to go to a. So Joe, if you're ready to, uh, you can share your screen and unmute yourself at will. Yeah, uh, John um, Schmitz from BL Companies. Uh, this is Joe Seapot, uh, Joseph Seapot Architects, is going to make, since it's a CAM presentation, John will make the, uh, the presentation. Okay. John, you should be able to unmute yourself and share your screen. Yeah, I just did. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. I we go. So for the record, uh, my name is John Schmidt, civil engineer with BL Companies, 355 Research Parkway, Meriden, Connecticut. Um, tonight before you for an application for a CAM, coastal area management application for 33 Island View Avenue. Um, houses in Pine Orchard is a waterfront lot. It's approximately 6,475 square feet. Um, the property is waterfront. Uh, there's a single family house on the property previously. And the proposal is to uh, construct a new single family house roughly in the same location, a little smaller footprint than the previous house um, and adjust the driveway and some patio space. Um, given that the house is waterfront and work is within 100 feet of the uh, of Island Sound, we obviously had to come before the commission for coastal uh, area management review. Um, pretty simple application and uh, it kind of completes my uh, my presentation, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Chuck Andrews share. Thank you, Mr. Schmitz. Evan, you want to review this? Uh, yeah, like Mr. Schmitz just stated, uh, the applicant is proposing to demolish and reconstruct a single family home uh, within the existing footprint of the uh, current home. Uh, the property is located within the Pine Orchard Association. Uh, there are coastal resources on and adjacent to the site. However, an existing concrete seawall separates the existing house from the resources. Uh, the proposed single family residential use is consistent with the surrounding residential area and the applicant satisfies the requirements of section 9.7 uh, 
Uh, staff recommends the following findings. The coastal site plan is consistent with the goals and policies of the Coastal Area Management Act. And one condition prior to the start of construction, the following shall be addressed to the satisfaction of the town planner or his designee. Uh, erosion control measures shall be installed and added to the site plan. Chuck Kinder, thank you, Evan. Questions from uh, commission members or staff? Comments? It's pretty straightforward. If no one has any questions, I still want to make a motion to approve the application and adopt the findings and conditions as recommended in the staff report. Chadwick makes that motion. Motion made by Joe Chadwick. Is there a second? Fred Russo seconds it. Second by Fred. Any further discussion? All in favor? Joe Chadwick, you in favor? Chadwick in favor. Fred? Fred's in favor. Uh, Joe Bayuso. Just gotta unmute him. Uh, I just asked him to unmute. You are unmuted. Yeah, Joe Bayuso accepts. Approved. Thanks, Joe. Joe. Marcy. Marcy. Marcy's in favor. Marcy's in favor. Here's also in favor, so that's approved. On old business, item number seven. It's also Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, um, so item number seven, it's the zoning text amendment for the solar regs. It's scheduled for a public hearing on the 21st. And then let's go back. I forgot the, pub, the, the, one, the one matter of uh, public hearings that I think we can vote on were the uh, items number five and six, the TCAN LLC, 49 North Harbor Road, protection for motor vehicle service and motor vehicle sales. Um, we did have that public hearing, and I think uh, if you can pull up the staff report on that. And uh, Evan, I, I guess the only question, do we want to add the any outdoor store should be in the rear? Uh, I don't, I think the, I think the applicant was good with that. It's a car dealership. You know, you sound like it would, wouldn't, well, it isn't likely to happen, but if it did, you can't really see it in the rear. That'd be the place to happen. So we didn't seem to have any objection. Sure, I can add that condition. Okay. So, uh, Anyone have any thoughts or comments? Again, like a niche use and be okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't have an issue, Marcy. Great. Thanks, Marcy. Yeah. But then someone will make a motion to approve the application with the with the uh, as amended again the fourth condition about any outdoor storage being in the rear. Marcy will make that motion. Motion made by Marcy. Is there a second? Is there a second? Yeah, it looks seconds. Chadwick seconds. seconds. And again, this is for both applications. There's actually two applications, one for the one for the uh, motor vehicle sales and service. I think the, the resolution covers both. Mm -hmm. So um, all those in favor, Joe Chadwick, you in favor? Chadwick in favor. Fred? Fred in favor. Joe Bayuso? Joe Bayuso in favor. Marcy? Marcy's in favor. And chair's also in favor. So then let's go down then, turning back to our agenda, we're under new business. New business. And we have uh, uh, 9 Elm nine Street, Elm Street item number one, that's a one, zoning one, map change one, that we need to schedule public hearing for, four, I guess. And I guess we'll, I guess we'll uh, Chair and I, or I mean, Aaron and I can review and set that when it's appropriate. Um, item number two looks like, uh, like uh, Special exception for a single family house for 45 West Haycock. And we'll need to schedule a public hearing for that one. That one. Um, I don't, I don't, yeah, for, Harry? I think you may need a variance. So uh, we're going to check with the schedule for that. But uh, so we can schedule a public hearing, you and I, when it's appropriate given possible action by the ZBA. Okay. Did you have a date for the first one at all? Did you think? Not at this point, no. Okay. Okay. And then item number three uh, looks like the Thimble Island, the uh, site plan modification to add Thimble Island Brewery, add patio and landscaping to the brewery. And again, that's something we'll, uh, I think. Yeah, I've got to get in touch with the applicant about uh, what might be needed for additional approvals. So I'll talk okay. To okay, so we'll just uh, 
Note all of those, and then go to other business. We have a referral from the Zoning Board of Appeals for a use variance application for 1519 Church Street. Someone yes, um, I'll give this a shot. Um, this was a subject to a, a zoning variance application, a use variance, um, I believe last year, uh, for conversion of what was a commercial use, the very corner of Church and Meadow. I know we have an echo, so I hopefully, I think probably that's you, Joe, sorry. Um, and even though Marcy's not participating in this, so she's just facilitating, putting the screen up. So this building here um, at the corner, um, single story with a peaked roof, had been a commercial use, um, was approved for use variance for conversion to a single family residential use. Um, apparently the property owners having uh, troubles burning into issues with the existing building as they're getting into the construction and it turns out it's really not uh, practical feasible to convert that structure. So now looking I believe at taking that down and they would like to um, locate a two family essentially behind that structure um, and that's something I haven't seen. I haven't seen these yet, but I assume they're going to be opposed to the ZBA. Um, I thought it was just one, two family. It looks like there's three buildings proposed in this drawing. Um, so that's, I don't know what the use is of the building proposed for the corner. Um, I think what was requested is a use variance. Let's see, I'm just looking at this, frankly. Build a new single family, a new two family residential unit. So I was a single family proposed on the corner and now two additional units. I think there's two other units in the existing building. So I think five units are being proposed on the property. Um, so you can see the drawing in front of you. And that is my understanding of the proposal. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals has an application in front of it at their meeting last week. They referred it as they required to do to uh, the commission for comment. They, I understand, will be taking this up in April at a public hearing at their meeting then. And what what's the zone? It's zone industrial. The zone is industrial, so residential is not, you know, allowed use. I believe a single family house might be allowed. I'll have to double check that. But what what's where's the abutting? Is the abutting land zone residential? Uh, the budding land uh, essentially above the proc to the top of the map is zoned our, well, I think that one is actually zoned industrial as well, even though it probably is in residential use. And then the property beyond that is the R1 zone. The property to the right, to the east is in zone industrial also, and is um, part of the Atlantic Wharf um, PDD development. So there's a large residential building and parking lot proposed for that property. It's already approved by the commission. What's the size of the parcel? That, I don't know if I have the answer to right off the top of my head. Um, I'll see if I can pull that up. Envision. <clears throat> It'll take me a second to be able with me. Harry, uh, do you, Harry, do you have, you hear me? Hi, uh, is this Joe? Yes, yep. Uh, I've got, it's at about 0.39 acres. So that's about, let me do the math. 0.39 times 43,560. <clears throat> 
I've got it about just under 17,000 square feet. So it's over a third of an acre. I don't know, Joe, is there anything you want to add to this? I don't know if yeah, we're so on. I, yeah, so um, when I came to you the last time, I had the last referral was for the single family use to put an apartment in the existing non-conforming commercial build, which is the building that <clears throat> you could see it in this plan, it's a dotted line. It's within two feet of the existing property line. So we got into that building <clears throat> and the um, renovations are basically exceeding the worth of that structure. So, what my proposal now is we'd like uh, this re referral request for the two family use. There's, I already have an existing two family on the lot um, which predates zoning, okay? So we, as I was saying, we got into the property on the small commercial space in the front and this cost has exceeded that property. So what my proposal is, is I'm looking to take that commercial space down, push it back to be conforming, which would allow me the streetscape and kind of clean up that corner. Um, <clears throat> then as we got into the project, we were looking at placing the two family house in such a way that it would screen all our parking and it would blend in better with the area <clears throat> um, before you get to the proposed new development. Um, Church Street, as you know, has a numerous amounts of multifamily houses coming down Church Street. So as far as facing Church Street, well, what it, we were proposing to do is take, as you could see the red lines, is that's the existing structure get rid of that and push the single family house back to make you know a much better streetscaped area. And then as you would turn the corner and come down on Meadow, that would be the look of the new two family house. Again, with all our parking in the rear, okay? It works on the lot. Um, the adjacent new development has a much higher density. Our plan provides the cover and density that are less than what is allowed in the IG1 zone. <clears throat> Be it that this site is also part of the TOD zone, we're looking to increase the walkable residences near the train station. Our plan will create a better streetscape because the single family building is moved back off the street line. The new two family, like I said, is all creates a screen for all the parking. We also feel that coming up meadow, after the new development is eventually built, this two family house will break it up and be more of an entrance way into a bigger development instead of just being a vacant empty area for parking. Um, so that's basically my proposal here. Again, I, I've been trying my best to save what is there. Um, we're, we're renovating the two family house right now, the existing, which in reality probably would have been cheaper to throw in a dumpster, but it has a lot of character and we've been working hard at trying to preserve that. And I feel that this plan kind of opens things up to this new TOD that everyone I know has been trying to get going in town. And my feeling is that doing this project could be the beginning of the TOD. We could add the landscaping to the street. And I don't know if, if everyone here is kind of familiar with this area on Church and Meadow, but the building I own on the corner really doesn't look it's right on the very corner and, and this plan would open it up, I think, and make it look a lot better. So I'll just say I did some quick math and what I got is um, 
um, one unit would there be uh, 3,400 square feet of lot area about per unit. So you're talking about about 13 dwelling units an acre and the density of the uh, joining Atlantic Wharf, I think is about 20. Mm -hmm. Harry, what do we, I mean, obviously we're not the Zoning Board of Appeals. It's right. referred to us what, just so if we have objections or what, what are we supposed to do? Um, well, any kind of comments you have, I mean, you really can consider the plan, you can consider the TOD plan, you can consider um, what's built as was cited in the immediate area and the density along Church Street. Um, I think all those are factors you can consider. Um, how it's going to fit into the area and all those things. Okay. okay. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have any objections. I mean, some, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, obviously it's not allowed at all, I guess, or maybe one unit is zoned industrial now or something, but. Um, well, there are two, so there's two grandfathered and, you know, there's the, right. there's already a variance for the conversion. So basically three units are allowed on the property through, um, you know, grandfathering or a variance. Okay. Again, what I would like to express is that what I feel is we're taking a nonconformity and we're really turning it into something that um, kind of fits the neighborhood better. And in doing that, as I said, looking at the lot, making that two family work, I think opens everything up going into the new development. And we've gone to ZBA and I think we have to go back to them again um, if it, you know, be it your approval, then we're still coming back in front of you again later on. Yeah, this would need uh, the two family special exception approval. And um, I think one, you know, it would be nice if the single family came along for the ride. Um, I think you'd get comments from the town center board, frankly, just throwing this out about the appearance of uh, the single family facing Meadow Street, just to give it more of a less of a, this is the side of a house and more of a, you know, this is a house or a structure looking at both streets with kind of, you know, front facing both, two fronts, if you will. Just a quick comment. Right, I mean. But you could add some I'm windows and do some things, yeah. Yeah, I'm not in objection to that. I just, we, we kind of thought that would work because we have a serious grade difference on Church Street. There's, yeah. um, right now there's a retaining wall that's falling apart. So that's why it was kind of facing it that way to be able to kind of maintain the grade. No, that makes sense. I think it's just a design thing. That's all. Right. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I don't have any objections. So I, I mean, I, I can't. I mean, it, it's not, it's presently not an application before us, but I guess we have, a, if we were very opposed, we would, this is our chance to tell the ZBA that you're wrecking our zoning regs, like if you grant the variances and I, you know, I don't really feel that, so I don't object. But... What, what, are, what do other people think? Chuck, Fred, Russo. Fred, yeah. Uh, I think at least what I see here, and I'm making an assumption that it meets all the zoning regulations, uh, any other variances it needs, looks better than what's there now. Uh -huh. And so um, I, I, I think I agree with you that um, I would have an objection to seeing this uh, in some form like it is, as opposed to what originally he wanted to do i think what he wanted to do where the, the way the building was located uh, was a, kind of a tough spot no matter what you do to dress it up you, you're never going to take it off the corner here at least he's got the building off the corner he's got landscaping and and uh, looks like a better use of the land so uh, i would just say in, in you know um, theory i think this is a better plan than what he wanted originally and what may end up there in the future thanks fred 
Joe Chadwick, any thoughts? Yeah, I think probably the industrial zone is obsolete. And rather than being a slave to a, a zone of history, um, we need to figure out some way to be more responsive to functional zones. Um, that's, that's about you know, the limit of my comment on it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Yeah. All right, thank, thanks, Joe. Jo Joe Vayuso? Any thoughts? Is he shut off? Uh, let me find him. I think he's probably muted. Yep. Uh, I'm asking him to unmute. So hopefully. You are unmuted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, Joe Vayuso. Yeah, I think it's a good plan. I'm not sure if that many units would fit there based on the parking. You got, I think I saw five or six spaces in the back for, five, for 10 units or five units. Is there five units possible or, or six units? Yeah, it'd be, it'd, be five units. it'd be five units. Yeah. Might be better to you know, take one of those units, have it into a, a single family. Maybe the, the, the two family, the two, two families on uh, Church Street and then Meadow Street facing one one family. I don't know. I mean, I'm just making sure that there's enough parking and not th not them taking advantage of the parking lot down which is approved for uh, the other the other site that they may it, take advantage. It, if I could if I could comment on that, comment on that. Um, yep. that's why that's what we're proposing we're is the two family will have family two garages. garages. So two of their cars yeah. will ultimately be inside the garages. And we actually could stack two cars behind those two. The single family house would have a separate garage attached to it and again have relief parking right behind it, which then leaves us with six spots. So the six spots would be for the other two family house and then any additional parking needed on site. Okay, well, I didn't realize there was garages there. That, that, yeah. that makes sense. In between the two, in between the two units, um, those are two garages, and then yeah. right alongside yeah. the single family is a garage. Well, uh, my personal, I know the garages are counted as a parking space, but my personal feeling is a garage is not a parking space. But you do have a, a space for a driveway for one space, at least in front of the garage door. Mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. So that, that 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 helps out a lot. That, so that's fine. If you have to, at least you have a driveway for one one uh, for each one of those houses. So that that's three spaces at the at the. Very end. So I think it, it's a good plan. I think it's a much better plan than what's there now. Thanks, Joe. Joe. Uh, Marcy, I think Marcy, you're here, right? You're right? So, so um, uh, Massimo, Massimo, any thoughts? Massimo, any thoughts? Um, I'm glad to see uh, that area being improved. Uh, I I like it. Uh, I just think uh, it, it's a good plan. Okay, thanks, Massimo. Sharon. Um, yeah, I would just um, hope that there would be uh, capacity to put solar on the roofs and also um, infrastructure for electric vehicle charging in the construction. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, so again, we don't have an application in front of us, but we're here to register. I, I think there's a consensus that there, there is no objection to it and, you know, different people saw, you know, there was improvement, seemed to be an improvement over what's there now. And, and, but, but obviously we don't make the call about whether they, other, you know, it's their decision. So, is that okay, okay. Harry? Harry, Harry, you muted. Harry, you muted. That's fine. I think we can express that consensus to the ZBA. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, so then we'll move on to item number two, which is the manager's report. Good night. Good night. Um, number two, planner's report. Um, uh, you probably received, uh, hopefully, an email from Trista. Um, there was a general email blast sent out for 
the uh, public informational meeting set up as a special meeting of the commission next Thursday and the 24th. Um, I sounded like most of you could make it. I think that'd be great. Um, we're planning on having Glenn Shoulder, who is the consultant who worked in the affordable housing plan, make a brief presentation. And then um, I think if we accepted comments from the public, that probably would be helpful to the process. Uh, that way we can sort of identify any commentary that might not have been brought up to the, uh, the steering committee or at the uh, previous, uh, we did have a previous informational discussion with a consultant working for uh, the Council of Governments. Um, so that's my hope for next Thursday night, probably keep it short, certainly won't be this late, I would think a couple hours maximum um, for that meeting. Um, the chair and I have discussed um, going the process going forward for the affordable housing plan. Uh, there's going to need to be some consideration by the commission of the plan and a decision to uh, set a public hearing. Um, so probably that discussion would need to happen because of the schedule on the 7th of April. Um, there needs to be a 35 day uh, notice or pre period before the public hearing can be held. So we're looking at having that on the 19th of May. Um, the plan um, per state law should be in place by June 1st. So uh, we've talked about possibly having a couple of backup meetings just in case we get uh, scrunched and between the, the public hearings and consideration of the affordable housing plan and the development review application workload. Um, so looking at possibly on the 14th of April as a special meeting backup and also possibly on the 26th of May. So if, I know it's very late, but if you could consult your schedules and get back to me, if there's any problem with either of those dates, just so we know we'd have a quorum and so forth, uh, that would be helpful. Harry, Even what were those, Harry, what were those uh, dates from yourself? We get a, a, April 14th. Yeah. And May 26th. Thank you. Yeah. So you can get back to me afterwards and given the fact that it's 20 past 11, that is all I have, thank you. Thank you, Harry. Okay, so uh, thank you, everyone. Our next meeting is an in-person meeting. Is that correct? I believe it's uh, on April right at, at the firehouse. At the firehouse. Okay. Okay. Harry, Massimo, Massimo here. Can you just send us a uh, uh, an email on those dates, please? I will. I will send that around. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any anything else from anyone? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion to adjourn? Take that motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> on that one. Uh, we'll give the Fred the motion, and uh, we'll give who made the second? Uh, it was Sharon Hutner. <laughs> Sharon, go ahead. <laughs> I second uh, the motion. <laughs> second, okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, Joe Chadwick, in favor Those of adjourning. In favor. Fred Russo, adjourn. Fred, you want us to adjourn? Adjourn. Okay. Uh, Joe Valuzzo? Yes, Fred says yes. yes. Yep, Joe Valuzzo approves. And Marcy? Marcy approves. Marcy approves. And Chair. Okay, Chair also approves. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org.